you know, he walks up to me and says, you know, would you consider traveling to Colombia, you know, to pick up some And I was interested. And then they would um, make the drugs in the form of the shoe, you know, so it would, it would be all taped up, it would be in plastic, and they would put it in, and then they'd seal it back up. And that's it. And you put them on, you walk right through the airport with them. But I'm looking at them, and it's just like, I get this like weird vibe. And when that thought comes into play, it's just like, bam. Everybody that was around me was Interpol, DEA, swarmed. You are about to witness a movie. Oscar Castro was a former drug mule who went to work for a Colombian drug trafficking organization when he was only 16 years old. He would fly with heroin hidden in the soles of his shoes from Colombia to New York City. In 2001, he got caught trying to smuggle heroin out of Ecuador and spent the next six and a half years in some of the most brutal prisons, not only in Ecuador, but in all of South America. His stories are so wild that they're almost unbelievable. I'm talking about prison riots that lasted for weeks, literally. Murders happened every day, they were commonplace. And of course, drug trafficking, high level drug trafficking, inside of prisons. This is such an unbelievable story. We couldn't fit it all into one episode. Go over to the Patreon, patreon.com slash the connect show for the epilogue to Oscar's story. And by the way, you can now get the fully uncensored main episodes on Patreon as well. Without further ado, by far one of the best episodes we've ever done. Oscar Castro right here on the connect with Johnny Mitchell. The third one was the worst one. All the jails united. It's like hunting season. You'd walk by a cell, you'd see a dead body. You walk by another cell, this one would be lit on fire. It was craziness. You know, I just, you know, promised the Lord when I got out, please help me get out. I'll never go back to any of this. You know, I just want to stay straight and narrow and just live a good life. That's when I see the lights behind me start to flash. And I didn't even think, I just hit it. I was driving like my life depended on it. Then I parked the car, hopped out, closed the door, and I started running. And he pulls out a burner, a shank, it's like six inches. And then he passes it to me. And he goes, here, that's yours. Don't ever leave the cell block without this. He was the reason I made it out of that place alive. Do you think you have more of a chance of dying inside of prison in Ecuador Most than you definitely. do on the streets? Yes. Wow. Yes. Is there any way to stay neutral? Like, I'm just here. I got caught. I just want to do my time. Like, you can in America, for the most part. I mean, it's, it's pretty difficult because over there, there's no classification. See, like, all my boys, everyone that I rolled with throughout the time I was in jail, most of them were murderers. Yeah. I mean, to keep it real, they were. everyone had a 25-year sentence. Yeah. Even when I was in F-Block and I was there twice, I was the only one there with a small sentence. Everyone is there is for... F block, the maximum security is when you intend to escape mm. or if you murder somebody mm. or if you, I've seen guards get murdered because sometimes they're corrupt and they f around with the mob mm. and they get hit. Whoever does the hit on that guy goes to F block. Yeah. All right. Now F block no longer exists because they closed down. Ex Penal Garcia Moreno, which was the jail, they shut it down and they build new jails like the American style. Yeah. yeah. High right? security. High security. Everything's bars. Before, like my jail, we had a wall and a door. So the guard, you know, he can't see inside your jail. When you have sleepover, your wife's inside, yeah. you're, you know, you're in your boxers all day. Yeah. You know, you're all day. Yeah. You're drinking liquor. You're smoking weed. You know, you're just chilling. Yeah. It's coke no, everywhere. Coke everywhere. No one could come inside your cell. So when your wife is there for the you almost feel like you're in like a motel room. Exactly. It's a <laughs> party time. You know yeah. what I mean? So it's a motel. You got your TV. You got music. Yeah. But then it's not just you, but it's another 2,000 yeah. prisoners with their wives, with yeah. their girlfriends. Yeah. You know, and, and if I'm making liquor, that means I got liquor, you know, for to sell. Mm. And people are doing parties. You know, you walk by a cell, the door's open. They got the speakers out in front of the door. People are dancing inside the cell. Some cells were gutted out. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're a mobster, you got money. Some cells, they could break down the walls in between one yeah. to the other, and they got a suite. Do some renovations on you, that You bitch. do renovations. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, that's how corrupt it was in there. But, but you said there's no classification. Does that mean they put in the low security inmates with exactly. the worst of the worst? Yep. They don't care? They don't care. You're in jail. They just open up that main gate and throw you in. Yeah. Now, the main gates of the jail had three blocks. Mm -hmm. So B block was the biggest. It had like 130 cells, I think. It was three floors. That's for like the lower, like poverty people. Right. This is for like the hitmen, you know, the sicarios, right. the, the thieves, and the big time drug addicts. And, we, those, and those are cells that people don't buy. Those are like the government exactly. cells. Exactly. I mean, you got to buy your cell. You know, but you could, you could buy a cell over there for a hundred bucks. Yeah. You know, a hundred bucks, 150, mm. 200. Cause they're. Yeah. And then you have C block, which was for 
all of the the foreign prisoners. Right? Yeah. C block is where like people from like Switzerland, yeah. you know, hardcore Colombian drug dealers, mm -hmm. you know, you could go walk in there and they'll, they'll show you a cell. Like, all right, this one's up for, you know, for sale. This one's four grand. Why is it four grand? It's got a modified queen size bed. So that cement block that was your bed before now is modified with a wooden extension. And they bought a queen size mattress and bought it in and put it right inside. Boom. If you want, you know, and you had a lot of money back in the day, you could pay the director of the jail to uh, for you to live by yourself. Yeah. So that top bunk, you take it out. Boom, it's gone. Yeah. So now you have like a mm -hmm. it's like a normal room. You know what I mean? So And who's that money go to if you to buy a director? Cell? The director of the prison. The director of the prison. Straight to his pocket. Straight to his pocket. Wow. You know, he'll give you the permits for you to bring in the construction crew. They'll come in. Wow. Construction crews inside. They're wow. painting, they're breaking down brick walls, right. you know. And Wow. The director pockets all that money. Yeah. So these cells, if you had enough money, these cells are pretty comfortable. Yes. You're like living in a C nice apartment. Yeah, I told you, C Block, they have queen size bed. It'll come with a microwave, yeah. with a ceiling fan. Yeah. It'll have, you know, 30 inch screen TV, DVD player all mounted on mm -hmm. the wall. You yeah. know, you can have a rug, you have marble floors, mm -hmm. whatever you want. You hook it up the way you want. What were foreigners in there for? Like people from Switzerland? Yeah. Drug trafficking. Yeah. Like yeah. Muling, muling, like trying to get yep. out of the airport exactly. with it. Yep. Yeah. Pretty much. Um, there was a lot of big drug, uh, drug Lords, like Colombians that were there, mm -hmm. you know, and they're just paying their time. They're, you know, mm -hmm. they're relaxing, you know, they, they have to have protection as well because you're a Colombian inside of an Ecuadorian prison, Okay, you know, and, um, the doors are always open. So, so you could get extorted. You can get you're extorted not easily. If mm -hmm. you're not, if you don't, you're not connected to the right people, you're getting extorted. Right. You know, what kind of extortion money does a Colombian kingpin have to pay to stay safe every month? I wouldn't know the exact numbers, but it's definitely in the thousands. Mm, wow, yeah, per month. So there, you think probably in an Ecuadorian prison, the gangs collect millions a year just in protection payments, protection and drugs, most definitely. Wow, you got to think about it. It's an open market inside, mm. right? If you have, if you're selling drugs, when I was there, you could sell drugs, sell liquor, and you would pay each guard one dollar. There's 26 guards on shift per shift, mm -hmm. right? 12 hour shift. Each guard gets $1 and then the head guard would come by your cell and he gets 10. Right. And they let you sell whatever you want. Right. You want to sell base, you want to sell Coke, weed, mm -hmm. liquor, whatever you want. And they use American dollars and everything's the dollar down yeah. there. You got, you got green dollars inside. Wow. I mean, there's no commissary. There's nothing. Mm -hmm. everything's, everything's a got, store. Everything's, everything's a cash. Shop. You there's stores. People mm -hmm. buy a cell, they convert it into a store. You know, they'll send, mm -hmm. um, what we call cachimochos, there's these guys that would come into the prison. You give them a list. Hey, I need this. They'd go out to the store and they'd bring back mm -hmm. whatever you needed. Rice, chicken, meats, milk, yogurt. Now, they'll charge you a lower price. Once it gets into the store, the guy in the store charges you double. Yeah. Obviously, because yeah. now it's inside the jail. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, I mean, everything is just more money inside. Do you think the Ecuadorian gangs make more selling drugs in prison than they would like on the streets of Quito? Yes, because it's more controlled. Right. Right. So it's it's definitely controlled 100%. Now, say like Fito, the guy that just left, mm -hmm. right? He, well, he left. He escaped. He escaped the jail. You have to buy from him and only him mm -hmm. if you're in one of his blocks. He controls about, I don't know, in the, the big jail in Guayaquil, it would be like eight to 10 blocks. Mm -hmm. And- Eight to ten blocks around two to three thousand people in each one. Yeah. So think about that. And so it's many of them are on city. drugs. And Everybody's addicted. It's There's 80, nothing 80 else. 80% to do. of people are addicted. Yeah. You know. When I was there, there was visits Wednesdays, Saturdays, and Sundays. Now they've been going for months without visits. Yeah. You know, because so they're locked down. These people are locked down. Yeah. They're going fing insane inside. You said, well, you were telling me before the pod, so you still actively are talking with people that are locked up in prison down there. Yes. And they tell you routinely, they're like, Hey, uh, there's about to, a riot's about to kick off. You want me to film this guy getting beheaded? Yeah. <laughs> Crazy shit like that. So those things happen now. They used to happen back in the day. Not, I haven't seen beheadings, but like I showed Just you the crazy, pictures, though. crazy yeah. stuff, you know, you, people would run up in a cell and stab you 30 times, take your ears off, comes out in the paper. And I've seen this, you know, firsthand. Guns? Are there guns, guns in there? People have guns. You know, if you read the news clips that I brought in, you know, the, the guy that got his ears cut off, he got murdered with a nine millimeter. He got shot. All right. Three yeah. people died that day. He's the only one that came out in the picture, but it was, it was something huge. Uh, well, don't they have grenades? They have grenades. Uh, the guy I have in the picture in the news clip that, you know, escaped in 2008, 
he has actual news clip on YouTube where you could see this, where a grenade goes off inside his cell. And then they film him coming outside, you know, blood's coming out of his ears. They're putting him in an ambulance. And this guy's been through hell. And what are they beefing over? Just territory, man. So territory within the prisons. Exactly. So this guy that got the grenade thrown at him, you know, he used to be in a different jail. He was doing too much over there, you know, selling drugs, extorting. He was the top dog. So then they send you to this spot called La Roca. This is what used to be like F block. Yeah, it's the (laughs) rock. La Roca, yeah. So F block used to be the rock before, but they closed that jail down. Now it's La Roca, it's in Guayaquil. Mm -hmm. So they send this kid over there and, you know, wherever you land, there's already somebody running that block. Mm -hmm. So he comes in and obviously there's different gangs there because whoever commits a murder or stabs somebody or extortion and, you know, they want to put you in, in max, you get sent there. So he comes in, you know, he wants to do his mobster, you know, ways as well, you know, because for someone that's crazy, this is a saying down there, for someone that's crazy, there's always going to be someone that's crazy. Mm-hmm. So he comes in, you know, he's got a bunch of bodies under his belt inside mm-hmm. the jail. He's taking people's ears off. You know, this kid's no joke. So he comes in and he's like, you know, this is my block now. I'm home. Yeah. And, you know, he came in with a couple of his friends. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a war. It's like a battle. And, um, but the, the problem is that you're in a battle with people that are feet away from you. Yeah. You know, we're all like really yeah. close proximity, you know, and then you have guns, nine millimeters, 38s, mm-hmm. you have grenades. You know, I, I put a, a clip on YouTube. I told you the other day about a friend of mine that was shot in, in La Roca. You know, he got shot nine times. There's a nine millimeter on the ground. He's on the ground bleeding. You know, my other friend got a grenade thrown in into his cell. Do they investigate these or do they pretty much just uh, I mean, wrap you up? And, there's really no investigation. Yeah. There's cameras everywhere. They see what happens. Yeah. You know, and, and, and nobody and gets arrested, really. The guy who did it, he's a, I mean, I don't want to say lifer, but he's got a sentence where he's not going home. Mm. So this is what they call come muerto. Yeah. So it means he eats the dead. Yeah. So if you got a problem with somebody, you could hire him. He'll be your hitman. He'll go and murk somebody. So there's for hitmen for hire in Inside, the prisons. Inside, yes, most definitely. What are the sentencing uh, structures like down there, like for drug trafficking and for uh, murder, murder compared to the United States? Okay. Like, so, and is there a parole system? Like, there, like there if is. you have life, but there's, then you're you have a good behavior, can you actually get out early and not spend the rest of your life in there? So there's there's really not a life sentence, mm. but they'll hand out 25 year sentences for like a murder. Now, say if it's like manslaughter, you could get 16. Mm-hmm. You know, it all depends on what happens, how you committed the murder. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So you were in prison down there for s- almost seven years. Yes. From what years to when? So December 18th, 2001, I got locked up and I was deported September 26, 2008. Yeah. Okay. So, but you're from New Jersey. Yes. Bring us up to how that happened. All right. Take us through from when you, you know, first uh, got connected and then, you know, up to your arrest. Okay. So, uh, starts off in a small town in Jersey. Mm -hmm. Um, By the way, you're Columbia. We should, and we're going to introduce that uh, as well to the audience. Tell us about your family first. Where in Colombia is your family from? Yeah, no, I don't know why you say I'm Colombian. I'm not. I'm not Colombian. You're not Colombian. No, no, I'm not Colombian. Oh, you just love no, no. Colombia as I a love, city. I went to Colombia to go traffic. You're Ecuadorian? No, I'm not Ecuadorian either. Are you an yeah. Italian guy? No, not Italian. Who, what, are you <laughs> kidding me? You're just a white guy. So listen, my parents are from Uruguay. Oh, right? okay, okay. I was born in Jersey, born and raised. All right, I got connected with the Colombians at oh. this job. And then I traveled there. I love Colombia. Oh, oh it's my God. It's a great God, country. Dude. Great, you know, great place to go. And I went there to traffic, but yeah, I'm not Colombian. Yeah, and you're dressed like a Colombian. You're dressed like you got an appliance shop. Like you got a, <laughs> you got a fake gold chain on. You got a nice watch. But you're from Southern South America, Uruguay. Yeah. Wow. Okay. All right. Well, there you have it, folks. Mitchell doesn't do his research before the guest comes in. Okay. This amazing episode you're watching with Oscar Castro is sponsored by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is America's number one fantasy sports app with more than 3 million members. It is the easiest and most exciting way to get in on the action while you watch your favorite sports and players. You just pick more or less on two or more player stats and watch the winnings roll in. Get in on the playoff action and win up to 100 times your money on Prize Picks as you and 
the world's best players take the game to a new level during basketball's postseason. Prize Picks has something for every sports fan, from basketball and hockey to League of Legends and everything in between. You can pick LeBron, Caitlin Clark, Connor McDavid, and June Bellingham, all in the same entry. If you're a fan of the show, you know Prize Picks by now. They've been sponsoring our show for a while. And honestly, they're one of my favorite companies that I've partnered with. I'm all in on these guys. I've been making picks every day on the NBA. And now that the playoffs are kicking in, I'm even more excited. And you guys know me. When it comes to technology, I'm the world's youngest boomer. I don't even know how to set alerts on my phone. But Prize Picks makes it so easy that even I can do it. And I love that it's just me against the numbers. There's no sharks or sports savants or bookies in Vegas. It's just me against the projections. $100 gets you in. And guess what? If you use my promo code, they're going to match you your first $100. Download the app today and use code CONNECT for a first deposit match up to 100 bucks. Again, get the app today and use code CONNECT, C-O-N-N-E-C-T, for a first deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less, it's that easy. Let's get back into it. So your family's from Uruguay, but yes. you grew up in Jersey. Grew up in Jersey, um, dropped out of high school. And my father told me immediately, you know, when you drop out, if you decide to, you're going to have to get a job. So I go and get this job and I'm in a van going to work like a Mexican, you know, in a van going to the warehouse with a bunch of, you know, illegal immigrants. Mm -hmm. And I start working at this warehouse, I meet this kid call him G and um, you know, we become friendly, you know, smoke a joint together during work at lunch break or whatever. And one day he invites me to his house, introduces me to his cousin, Ricky. And um, from there they invite me to a party. Mm. So I get to this party and this gentleman, Ricky has an uncle that's there, you know, mostly Colombian traffickers. And, you know, he walks up to me and says, you know, would you consider traveling to Colombia, you know, to pick up some heroin? And I was interested. So, and you speak Spanish? Yes. Okay. So they kind of trust you a little more. I guess they, yeah. I mean, they know me. I mean, I live in the same town as, mm -hmm. you know, his nephew. And um, you know, I wanted to do it. I was a young kid. I wasn't scared of anything. And I was, I was willing. I guess did, I was just dumb. Did you have yeah. criminals in your family? Did you no. have a... I had the best examples that I could have as parents, both hardworking immigrant family. Um, you know, my father uh, worked as a lawyer's assistant. My mother owned a deli, which was like from 5 a.m. to like 10 p.m. You know, they were always working. So yeah. the best example I could have were my parents. Oh, you know, wow. Yeah. This So this is cowboy. I just didn't, you know. Wow. I just didn't want that life. I wanted to be you know, the trafficker. I wanted to go out. I guess it's because of the movies or the mm -hmm. music, whatever the case may be. But it was in me and I wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. So I met this guy. He told me about this trip. I said, let's go. Let's do it. You know, I'd never been to Colombia, mm -hmm. but I, I was excited to do it. And did heroin make you scared? Did any of this? No, not really. I mean, to me, it, it um, didn't scare me at all. I mean, I've been around people that, that have done drugs and, and been around drugs since I was like 14. But, you know, heroin seemed risky, but I, I wasn't scared of anything. Mm. And the, the way they paint the picture is, you know, you're going to do a six hour flight. You come back, whatever you bring back, you know, it's 20 a gram and that's it. So $20 a gram was the, $20 a fee. gram was the, was the going rate at the time. Okay. Yeah. So you're, so if you bring back say two kilos, uh, 2000 40, grams, 000. that's a real good, yeah. that's a real good fee for just you know, bring it for a the trip airport. for a six hour trip. Yeah. And besides the fact that you go down, you know, you're partying yeah. women, you know, parties, whatever you want down there. And so, you're only 16 years old. Yeah. At the time. Yeah. I was about to be 17. Yeah. Wow. Um, and how much did they say you were going to be picking up? So the first trip they said it was a kilo. Mm -hmm. So when we got back, you know, they picked me up at the airport, traveled to an apartment in Queens that was on 111th street and 41st Avenue just a, a brick building, went upstairs, you know, it was uh, some girl's apartment, went inside, you know, started opening up the shoes because we brought in the shoes. So this is pre 9-11. So how did it, how did it go? In the shoes that you were wearing? Yeah. So, the soles of your shoes? So the shoes I had on, it was, uh, I'm not going to say the exact number, but I believe it was like 300 in each shoe. And then it was probably like 300 in each uh, shoe that was in the bag, or it was 400 in each shoe 
and there was 300 in each shoe in the bag. It was something like that. You know? So you had four shoes total. I had two pairs. Yeah. So the shoes I had on and then the other pair that was in in the the luggage. And how do they get the heroin? They put it in the soles of the shoe? Yeah, ba basically they just, you know, rip up the sole of your shoe. They scrape out everything. Mm -hmm. So it had to be a shoe like a New Balance mm -hmm. or an Adidas or a Pumas that had the thick sole. So they, they gut it out. You know, basically a shoemaker would do this. Mm -hmm. They would gut it out and then they would um, make the drugs in the form of the shoe. You know, so it would, it would be all taped up. Yeah. It would be in plastic and they would put it in and then they'd seal it back up. They'd give it, you know, a good time to dry so there's mm -hmm. no smell of, you know, the chemicals or mm -hmm. the, the super glue that they were using down there. And, and that's it. And you put them on, you walk right through the airport with them. Yeah. So you got over a kilo. Yes. Because so you time. had about, whatever, 13, 1,400 grams. I think, uh, I think the first time I made 22,000 on the first trip. Wow. Yeah. The second trip, it was 28. It was more, I remember. So you could see how it wouldn't be hard to get if they got you a, a, a middle-class kid from Jersey to make, take a risk like this, you can see how it's the easiest thing in the world to grab a girl from a village outside of Cartagena or Pereira and say, Hey, do you want to make uh, an Amer Do you want to make two years salary in of one run? Yeah. Wow. Okay. So tell us about the trip down there. And this was what made you fall in love with Colombia too. Yeah. So the first trip down there was was pretty exciting for me. You know, never been to Colombia. I land down there. I got this guy, older gentleman, waiting for me with a sign. Mm. The sign said Pacho. So uh, I was told to look for a guy with a sign named Pacho. So I get there. I see the guy. Picks me up. You know, says, how you doing? I'm, you know, Tulio's brother. We're going to go to my house. And this is in Bogota? No, this is in Pereira. Okay. So we go to his house. You know, this guy lived in... Uh, small part of Pereira called Dos Quebradas. And we get there, he introduces me to his wife, his kids, you know, it's his house. And uh, we sit down for dinner. You know, I guess the whole family knows why I'm coming. Mm -hmm. Obviously they know what kind of business he's in. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's it, you know, takes me out. Let's go out party. What do you want? You want some girls? He told his son, get this kid some weed. He wants to smoke a joint. Mm -hmm. And you yeah, so they get, they want. get you relaxed. Of course, yeah. you know, yeah. they're ba they're basically for whatever you need, they're there. Yeah, but they're basically, you know, prepping you, throwing you a party because they know you might be spending a decade in prison if you get yes. popped too, yeah, yeah, going yeah. to the airport. Yeah, they don't want you snitching in the, in the future. Did uh, did you know about any other people, any other mules that they were setting up to make a run as you were down there? My first trip before I left one of this guy's Tulio's girlfriends had a son mm -hmm. and I knew him. He was young. He was 14 and she sends him on a trip down there and he's bringing back drugs and he doesn't even know it. Yeah. Yeah. So he goes two days prior from when I left, when I get down there, this kid's already there at the house. He's playing with the other kids, you know, because they were around his age. Yeah. I was 16, but I was almost 17, and I, I always grew up around older people. So you know, I was just in a different, my movie was different. He was like mm. little kid. And I was Damn, doing and the so growing up was, stuff. She was putting her own son. She was putting her own son at risk. So he brought back, um, I don't know if you've seen those Nintendos that have like 100 games in them. Mm -hmm. Brought back one of those, and then he brought back, um, the CD holders, mm -hmm. you could hold like 40 CDs in them. And the bottom, they would cut it and they would do like a, uh, it's called doble fondo, like a double bottom. Mm -hmm. And they stack some heroin in there mm -hmm. too. And boom. So I gave it to him before he left. Yeah. Like, Here, take this back to your uncle Tulio, he would call him. And he took it back to him. So you imagine like they got to have runners, I'm sure going all, coming, all the yeah, time, of, coming in and out. Of course. Yeah. I, mean, I, I work with them. So eventually I would find out. Eventually, you know, I would also work going to pick up passengers you know, at the airport in Queens. Oh, so you so were picking up people. When I wasn't doing runs, I'm yeah. working with them. We're doing all kinds of things. Okay. So yeah. what are you picking up? Uh, who's mostly, who are you mostly picking up? Are they women or are they men? Couples. Okay. Yeah, they were couples. So- uh, And how were they normally smuggling it through? Same thing, shoes. Okay. Yeah, what about like the swallowing of balloons? We we didn't deal with, with that. Okay. Yeah. Is that mostly Coke? Or is no, that just could, a different? No, you could do both. You could do both. Why, yeah, why couldn't you do heroin? You could do both. Yeah. Is that just a more kind of risky, like brutal way? Well, it is brutal. Say if you swallow it and it explodes, you're dead. Right. You know, all the chemicals that are in, the, in your of stomach, course. they're going to start eating away at that. Because right. they, they package it up. It's compressed into a, into a little um, yeah. 
little pellet. finger, little mm-hmm. pellet, and then it gets packaged with the surgical glove mm-hmm. fingers, and then at the end it gets dipped in wax a couple times, mm-hmm. right? But um, but what's the advantage, I guess, to doing that versus just putting it into a shoe or a false bottom in a suitcase? I think that came after nine eleven, where. After 9-11, you couldn't walk through the airport with a pair of shoes. Right. You're getting caught because everything is getting screened. Right. You're going through scanners. They're they're taking your shoes. They're punching holes in them. They don't know if you, if you have you know explosive devices in them. Right. You're getting everything's going through the scanners. Right. Before that, there was no issue. Right. Okay. Interesting. So they made it more dangerous for the mules after 9-11 because now they got to swallow. You got a kilo of heroin you in your swallow. stomach. Yep. Damn. That's wild bro yeah, yeah you know i remember when i was uh you know my dirtbag days i'd be you know running around with these you know women of the night in places like cartagena <laughs> yeah. and um you know the the peripheries right like these towns in colombia where beautiful women either become prostitutes single mothers or they work you know at a little stand uh everybody knows somebody that swallowed yeah you know that's Figure, in, but in a few yeah. ways, but like everybody knows like somebody that, you know, took that risk and, you know, put like 1500 grams of dope in their stomach. And yeah, I mean, you're like, dude, the, the desperation yeah. is a brutal, that's brutal business. That's It's you brutal. Know? It's brutal. You're risking your life pretty much. There. Yeah. I mean, I also risk my life by bringing the shoes because then I got locked up and I got sent mm-hmm. to a, a prison in a foreign country, right? What were you uh, before that, though? So you make your first run, you collect a big bag. Uh, was it thrilling going through the airport? Were you scared? Oh, the like, adrenaline. Forget about yeah. it. So my first run was in uh, 98, and there had just been an earthquake in the town of Armenia. I've been to Armenia. You've been there. Yes. So I ran through there when the earthquake just happened like two weeks prior. The city was, it looked like Iraq. All the buildings were falling. The jail, the walls of the jail had broken, fallen all over the place. All the prisoners escaped from the jail. (laughs) It was insane. So that was the excuse for my trip. I went down there because my grandmother lives in Armenia. I went to go visit her. I came back and, you know, I just went and left her some money because she's got to build a house. And that was my excuse when I'm coming back through customs. So you always have a backstory. You got to have a backstory. And do they only send people with American passports, I assume, right? Yes. Okay. Interesting. You know, American passport, nobody's really, back in the day, nobody was really checking. Right. Okay. Um, So what were, and, and you make that trip. You get your money, then you start working with this guy and his basically his yeah, organization with, with the crew. Yeah, it was like five of us, and they're out in Queens, probably uh, Jackson Heights. That's where all the Colombians are. We, we were in Corona, Corona too. Yeah, yeah. we were in Corona. So, w- what other things are you doing? You're picking up the mules that get in through the airport, but are, are you actually like selling bags for them? No, we're not selling bags. We're selling the weight. So we had connects that we would take, you know, the drugs to in Elizabeth. Okay. I don't know if you've ever been to Elizabeth, but Elizabeth at the seaport used to be the projects back in the day. Uh-huh. You could run through there in your car and there would be, you know, 50 people staying on the, each corner. Yeah. It was popping. It was crazy. So you're just delivering. So we the... had the connect of the guy that actually ran the PJs down there. Okay. And we would go, we would give him, you know, like the stuff I brought back, we took to him. And you stuff sold that it. came back, of, uh, you know, the next week mm-hmm. we took to him because he was, he was selling, he would brick it up. And he would sell on the streets. He had his people out right. there. Right. Oh, so he's, get, uh, he's getting pure heroin. He's getting pure heroin. So wow. this is the thing. He was getting it firsthand because we're firsthand. This is straight off the plane. Yeah. He's getting it firsthand. Yeah. He's getting it at a good price. What are you selling a kilo to him for? Those days, it would be, it would fluctuate, but yeah. we would get him like 62, 64, 65, right. you know, but we're getting it from the transportation point from Queens. Once yeah. it lands- Depending on what the price was, our boss Tulio would give it to us fifty two fifty five. Okay. So me and my boys would transport it. We make it to a quick ten G's. We right. split up because we're taking it. You know, we're getting the yeah. money. We're bringing it back, and that's okay. you know, that's what we're getting paid to do. So Tulio, after paying the mule whatever twenty five G's, yeah, uh, and then ten for delivery, he's making about twenty five thousand off a kilo. Yep, and then the guy in the projects is making so four he's times breaking it that because yes. he's breaking it Because you could take heroin, unlike Coke, uh, you can only step on Coke so many times before no, your fiends yeah. will buy it. Heroin, you can, pure heroin, just stretch it. Yeah. He was chopping it up, making yeah. tons of bricks. Yeah. This guy was making a lot of money. And what kind of, do Colombians still push heroin anymore? Is that even a thing? I'm not sure. I mean, I'm, I'm out of the game for Obviously, years. Obviously, so I don't know, but you know, I you have, have no your idea. ear to the- 
but what's going on down there a little bit. What I do know is, you know, in the jails, it's big down there in, really? in Ecuador, you know, everybody's, you know, doing bass, doing heroin, sniffing Coke. I mean, things haven't changed. Yeah. It was like that when I got there. And everyone's smoking weed. It's just a lot more expensive now. Yeah. Hey guys, this episode is brought to you by our longtime partner, Mood. If you're a fan of the show, you know Mood by now. They are my favorite online dispensary. But wait, they've made some changes. Mood has long been associated with Delta 8, but now they have an offering of many other types of products, including Delta 9 and THCA. But don't worry, they're still federally legal. That's right. These guys have worked with federal agencies to comply with all federal laws and figured out how to supply THC-based products legally. Their online dispensary offers a wide variety of flour, pre-rolls, edibles, gummies, vapes, and concentrates. All products ships discreetly right to your door. Head over to hellomood.co to learn more about what makes them such a great company. And while you're there, use my coupon code CONNECT20 to receive 20% off your first order plus a free five-count pack of gummies. That's right. Use code CONNECT20, C-O-N-N-E-C-T-2-0 at checkout at hellomood.co for 20% off your first order plus a free five count pack of gummies. Thank you so much, Mood, our favorite and longest running sponsor. Okay, let's get back into the episode. So so it's safe to say that like a lot of product that gets uh, prepared, whether it's heroin or Coke or weed, uh, a good amount of that stays in the countries f for the consumption in the prisons. Yes. I would believe that the worst of it stays there. I think they're good product. They push out to Europe. Yeah. You know, right now the seaports, um, the battle is because they're shipping most of it to Europe. Mm -hmm. Not too much of it's coming to the States now. But yeah. like from Machala, um, Vince, Guayaquil, mm -hmm. it's all going to Europe now. Yeah. Because that's where the big money is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So you're, you're making good money. You're 17, 18. Making good money, living on my own, you know, partying with these guys every night, yeah. you know, women, you know, just going crazy. Mm -hmm. I never had this kind of money in my life. Mm. You know, first time I got back, when you get those 20 grand in cash, it's like, what am I going to do now? What are you, mm -hmm. You're 17, you want to go party. Yeah. Right? So that's what I did. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, blew all the money. But as we're partying, we're also doing things on the side. Yeah. You know, I saw, um, I saw an episode you did with the guy with the fake bills. Mm -hmm. I had a run with fake bills as mm -hmm. well. You know, we would just dabble in a yeah. bunch of different things. Um, why did you decide to make the second trip down there? I just, I wanted to. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted, okay. I wanted to, I wanted more money. Mm -hmm. I wanted to go down and have a, a good time again, yeah. you know? So and, take us through that second trip now. So you're, you're, are you getting more or is it still the same rate? Same price. 20 a gram. Same price, 20 a gram. Um, this time I land in Medellin mm -hmm. where a gentleman meets me, same sign, Pacho. Picks me up, uh, takes me to a hotel. You know, he tells me that tomorrow I'll be back around, you know, I think it was like eight, nine in the morning. He's like, this, we're going to Pereira. But I landed in Medellin because the first time I landed in Pereira. So I want to have a different stamp on my passport. Uh -huh. Landed yeah. in Medellin. This guy takes me in car. We're going through the mountains, at like an eight hour trip all the way to Pereira. Mm -hmm. End up in the same house. <laughs> same guy, yeah. same family. He's back. Hey, what's up, guys? How's it going? You know, it's all, it's all organized. It's all from, organized. From the buyer, your guy uh, in, in Queens, all the way down to the receiver at the airport yep. to the, the guy who's running the stash. That's right. Yeah. So you pick up, um, is it in the shoes again? Yeah. Same thing. This time it was a pair of shoes and I don't know why they did this, but the second pair were a pair of sandals, like beach sandals. So we had like a wet pair of, um, like swim shorts and the sandals in a Ziploc bag. Okay. And it was like sandy, grainy, yeah. like, like I had just come from the beach or Try something. Trying to make it gross. Yeah. So do they give you the backstory? No. Beforehand? Or that's up to you? No, no, yeah. It's uh, I just think about what I'm going to say when I get there. Okay. You know? um, did they talk to you about what happens if you get caught? Of course. What did they, they tell you? Well, they told me, you know, you're going to end up in jail. That's the first thing. And then, you know, they said, we'll help you out which was a lie. That's all they say. We'll yeah. help you out. Yeah, we'll help you out. Give us a call. We'll help you out. Te ayudamos. Yeah, te ayudamos. Yeah, okay. But, uh, Is there happen. a bail system? Not down for there? drugs. In Ecuador, there's no bail for, for uh, drug trafficking. Hang on, because we're still in Colombia. So I want to separate. Oh, At this I'm point, sorry. we're still in Colombia. In Colombia, are you aware of a bail system for drugs? Not sure. 
I'm not wow. sure. I don't believe there is though. Wow. So you get caught drug dealing. You're staying in there until you're you staying. go to court. Yeah. And get your sentence. Yeah. Wow. That's the way it is. That sucks. Yeah, most definitely. I well, mean, it's, but it's smart because a guy like you, it's nothing. I'm not coming back. No, of course not. You'd be on the first thing smoking. I would have been gone. Yeah. Well, it's the same way in the States. If you're an illegal, you know, Mexican and you get caught with a bunch of dope, yeah. you're going to get a, a no bail hold. You're going to get an immigration hold on you because they know as soon as you bail out, you're, you're gone. Leaving. Yeah, of course. Um. Okay. So, but the second trip you get through. Yes. Second trip I land. I remember uh, this guy, Tulio, telling me, when you come back and you get to the customs line, look for a woman. Look for an elderly woman. That's going to be who you're going to go to. And that, that could be your abuela. That's right. So, Did you ever have, uh, when you went through, when you were at the customs guy, going through customs at the, the agent, Yeah. did you ever, did it ever get tricky? Like, did he ever get Questioning? suspicious of you? No, yeah. Never. Wow. No. Did you, when you walk up, did you put yourself in some kind of like meditative state? Like, how did you keep from sweating? I would say you're in a meditated state from the moment you got the stuff on you. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you're on a flight, of Avianca flight, mm -hmm. coming back from Colombia. Yeah. So, you know that back in the day, tra trafficking was big, especially yeah. on planes. So, there's got to be a Fed or a D agent on yeah. this plane. I'm right. pretty sure they got one or two that's sitting on this plane and is flying back and forth yeah. all day yeah. to Colombia, coming back. You know, that's probably yeah. his job, watching people, you know. Yeah. My second flight, I had um, I had a gentleman sit next to me, started asking me questions. I'm like, you know, what were you doing? Where'd you go? So, you know, I just answered him, you know, politely, but, you know, I cut him off pretty quick. Right. That was a little suspicious to me. Interesting. You know, who knows who he was. Right. But Talking to you in Spanish? No, in English. Oh. Yeah, in English. He was like suit and tie. But, you know, I was young and good thing I was smart. At least at that moment, I didn't, you know, talk about anything mm. suspicious. You know, did my flight, got there, came off, got to the customs line, looked for an elderly woman, found one, and I got in her line. So when I pulled up, she was like, oh, what were you doing in Colombia? I was like, oh, I went to go visit my grandma. She's, oh, he's such a sweet boy. Stanton, it. Welcome back to the U.S. Okay, no so that questions was, asked. So that was psychological. If you get in the line behind the sweet old grandma and you go up to the, the line right after her. No, I was looking for the sweet old grandma as the customs agent. Oh, I see. Looking for an I elderly see. woman. Oh, right? who was working as the customs yes. agent. Oh, okay. He said, look for an elderly woman. You know, she's going to let you go by. I'm telling you. That's what I look so for. So was she paid off? No, she wasn't paid off. They Not just they had just had they an just eye said, on you know, her. Right. No, it's just, you know, you're a young white yeah. kid with green eyes. Yeah. You don't look like a trafficker. Right. Just look for a woman. You know, maybe she might like you and that's why she's going to let you go by right. with no problem. Okay. Right. Okay. So that's why they told me to do it. The Mexicans do did. that too. Uh, Ed Calderon, who's been on this show, yes, you know, I've famous. Yeah. He tells me they got, uh, they have sentries posted up in these high rises looking down on the, the ports of entry yep. in Tijuana and they'll be on, they'll be on communication, like on a radio with the mules that are driving up in the lines and they'll okay. say, they'll say, go to the black guy. See, vete al mayate. Yeah. Yeah. Like he's, he's, I've seen something like that, that they do at the border and they're all like with the binoculars and yeah. they're like, oh, go in lane three. Yeah. This is the one where you're going to get through. Yeah. This chick looks tired. Yep. You know exactly. what I mean? Just go. Yeah. And they say, never go to the Asians. Yeah. The Filipinos are the worst. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they're the meanest. Yeah, exactly. They're the meanest yeah. and yeah. they take their job the most seriously. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Okay. So you had no problems. The second run you get through no problems, but another... check this out, get through the second run. I get out and I'm start, I start calling my contact. Nobody's picking up this time. I came back with more, right? How much dope is on you? How much heroin? I, I have, um, I believe it was 1200 grams total. Uh -huh. And then I had Bolivian cocaine that I had put in a wallet that I made, especially for me. It was 50 grams. It was the best cocaine I ever tried in my life. It was like yellow. Mm. So when I tried it down there, I was like, oh, I got to have this, take back, party with the boys. I bought some, had it put in a wallet, and I was bringing it back. Now, I get through customs. I'm at the phone. I'm making the calls. I hadn't, I didn't have any cash because the guy that took me to the airport, obviously, I was like, bro, here, take all this cash. I'm about to go make some you know, real money. Right. I gave him everything I had. Right. I just kept change to make that call because right. back in the day with pay phones. Mm -hmm. So I gave him all my dough. And when I'm, I'm making the calls, nobody's picking up. None of my contacts. I'm like, Jesus, what am I going to do? I'm sitting here. I already made it. You know, I made my, my, my trip and I'm stuck at the airport. Who do I call? 
my mother. Ma, I'm I'm at JFK. You can you come pick me up? Yeah, no problem. She comes and picks me up. Before she gets there, my guys roll up. Oh, I'm outside sitting on the luggage. Yeah. I got customs walking by. Yeah. You know, it was just it was horrible. Mm. So they take me. I jump in the car. We go into the parking lot. I take the stuff out and give it to them. Boom, mm -hmm. boom, boom. All right. I was like, bro, I got to go. My parents are coming. You assholes didn't pick up. <laughs> I had to call them. They're like, oh, my God. They were all like drunk, hung over. Yeah. I was like, all right, I'll see you guys later. And I just jumped in the car. And <laughs> yeah. And, you know, they took me back to the spot where I was waiting for my parents and they came yeah. eventually and picked me up. Now, you know how every kid feels with an alcoholic father after waiting yes. after soccer practice, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Wow. So these guys w didn't always have their shit together. Oh, man. Horrible. Especially not the workers. Yeah. I'm sure the the top dogs do. Yeah, the top dog was pretty upset about that because I was waiting there for like two hours. Now, what what if you had gotten caught on the, well, both sides? Like, what do you think they're, you know, the guy, the boss in the States and the boss in Colombia, if a mule gets caught, what kind of like, I mean, you know everything about him. You know where his baby mama lives, you know where his family lives, you know about your guy in the States, like... Do they have any, do they lie to you? Do they have any kind of like plausible deniability? I don't know. Did you think about that at all? Yeah, I thought about it. You know, obviously it's um, something you have to think about. You might mm -hmm. get locked up. Maybe the trip doesn't go as planned, but I just never thought about snitching. It was never in me. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I believe, you know, once you, you get in the game, you got to go in all the way and, you yeah. know, play by, play by the rules. Yeah. You know, that that's the way it was. Okay. If, so you were ready. Like I you were ready. prepared to get locked yeah. up. I mean, mentally. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then you have to be, if you're in the game selling dope, if you- It's going to eventually happen. My father yeah. always told me, you know, he told me before I left the sec that trip to Ecuador, you know, um, I had to go to the house to pick up my passport because I, I always leave uh, important stuff there. <laughs> and he was there. He sees me. He's like, where are you going? He sees me with my passport in my hand. Yeah. I'm going on a trip. He's like, are you going to come back? So I turned around. I'm like, what are you saying that for? Of course I'm going to come back. Like, I don't know. He's like, the life you're leading- you're going to end up in jail or dead. Did they? he know what you were doing? Of course. They knew what I was doing. Yeah, I would come in and out the house, uh, you know, showing money and different things. And They didn't know things. about the muling, though. <sighs> they, they probably imagined it. So my parents, on the first trip I did, they invited me to go to uh, Florida with them. Mm. Where they were going to meet some family members that were coming up from South America. Now, I go on my trip. I said, no, I can't. Maybe I'll call you. I'm going to be in Miami. I might stop by Orlando. I lied. I was going to Columbia. When I'm in Colombia, I make a phone call to their hotel from the house I'm in. Mm -hmm. Now, you have to call an operator back in the day to mm -hmm. make that international call. And this idiot calls the hotel and lets them know you have an international call from Colombia, from Oscar, your son. Mm -hmm. So when she gets on the phone, she's flipping out. She's like, what are you doing in Colombia again? You know, I thought you told me you were going to be in Miami. So, yeah, they knew what I was doing. They know uh. I, was, I was leading the wrong life. Yeah, you know, and, and you're um, 18 years old or something. Yeah, the 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 second trip I was like 18. Mm. So you know, what can they say? Yeah, what can they do? I'm 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 a grown man by that time. I'm gonna do what I want anyway. Yeah, you know, do there's what no you stopping want. me. Your parents just sacrificed everything. Yeah, to come to the states. That's the way it is, man. Um, did you have any brothers or sisters? Stepsister. Okay. Yeah, but you didn't really have. You know, it seems like you the, you let the street take you. Yeah. I, I, I went hard. I went fast. to the streets. Yeah. yeah. Like directly. So then how does Ecuador come into play? Why Ecuador on this third run? Because we had already done two runs to Colombia. Okay. Right. So we got multiple stamps on that passport from Colombia. And I had stamps from like Argentina and Uruguay that I'd flown to prior. Mm -hmm. So we decided on Ecuador. Okay. So tell, tell us about this. Your, your guy, Ticho, uh, the, the, the boss in Tulio, Tulio. Tulio yeah. in New York. Yes. Did he also have plugs in Ecuador? So yes, this is where um, Ecuador comes into play because he can get the drugs transported because they're doing it now, transporting from Colombia to Quito. Right. And there's passengers going there to pick up because oh, Colombia is getting a little bit hot. It's getting hot. You know, 98 right. was okay. 99, it's getting a little bit hotter. Yeah. As the years progress, it started right. getting hotter and hotter. Yeah. And these yeah. were the years too that because now that's a main route. It goes, the routes go Colombia south into Ecuador and then leave from the ports, if we're talking about gigantic yeah. quantities, and then they set sail through the Panama Canal and go straight across the Atlantic to yep. Europe. Uh, so so the mules are going, so you're picking up Colombian drugs in Ecuador. In Ecuador. Okay, gotcha, yes. perfect. And that's out of Quito? Out of Quito. Okay, yeah. the capital. Yep. Okay, so yeah, 
Floor is yours. What so, happened? Landed in Quito. This trip was all wrong from the beginning. Landed there. Um, my luggage never arrived. That was the first thing. Second thing, there's nobody there waiting for me. Mm. So I had to catch a cab to the hotel. Um, and I was days without communication with the guy that was supposed to bring the stuff. Mm -hmm. So I'm calling New York. I'm like, hey, what's going on? I mean, this guy doesn't show up. You know, I'm not going to just take the stuff and leave the last day. Like, what's going on here? So like, don't worry, give him a chance. You know, he's going to be there. He's on his way or whatever. I know the trip from uh, Cali to Quito was long. So I was like, all right, let's give him a chance. Maybe he doesn't want to stop. Doesn't want to make phone calls. What happens is this guy eventually gets to the border with uh, Ecuador and Colombia. It's a small town called Tulcan. I've been. You've been there. Mm -hmm. All right. So, it's hot down there, bro. Yes, I know. So think about it. When did you go? I went 2009. Okay. So I was there in 2001, which was off the charts. Yeah. You got gorillas. You got the gorillas, Las Farc, yeah. LN, M13. Yeah. We got all these, you know, guerrilla warfare gangs everywhere yeah. on the front, on the frontier. Lawless down there, bro. Yes. Crazy. So this guy gets caught at the border. Okay. He gets nervous. I don't know what the hell happened. He gets caught. So they put him in a jail. They let him think about it, I guess, for a day. And then this kid's like, you know what? I'm taking this stuff to Quito. This is the guy I'm taking it to. He's in this hotel. They set up an operation um, with uh, Quito. They call, I guess, Interpol, the police, whatever the case may be. And they do a sting operation on me in the hotel. Okay. Now, since I feel like something's funny mm -hmm. for days, I leave the hotel to do my own like sting operation. Supposedly I'm in front at the Swiss hotel. There's a casino on the first floor. I go to the one in slot machines that it's directly in front of a window where I could see the main entrance to my hotel. So I know the kids come in that day and I'm sitting there playing the slots, just watching the door, but I never saw anything, you know, that would have made me suspicious. Mm -hmm. So the time comes when the guy, the guy's supposed to be there. So I walk out, I go straight, walk right through the front door. And the receptionist is like, Hey, Mr. Castro, your friend. So I turn around, bam, I look and I see this guy. I didn't know what he looked like, mm. but obviously we have to look like, hey, what's up, yeah. buddy? How you doing? So I go, you know, hug him. How's it going? First thing I notice immediately is this kid does not smell good. You know, so it doesn't smell good is a big red flag for me because, you know, when you're in the drug game, everybody wants to look good, mm. smell good, you know, this kid smelled like death. Yeah. It smells like he's been in jail for three years. Yeah, and I was like, what the hell? And then we sit down and, uh, this guy, you know, he has one of those, uh, kangaroos, they call them mm -hmm. with those backpacks that you yeah. put. So he takes it off. He puts it next to me and we're just talking, you know, like chit chatting. And he's like, yeah, the stuff's in here. I got to go back to the hotel. I'm going to go take a shower and all that stuff. But I'm looking at him and it's just like, I get this like weird vibe. Mm -hmm. I'm like, all right, bro, no problem. And then when I grab the bag and I get up to leave, I feel it's like, it's not, there's not a key in there. Mm -hmm. Definitely not a key. I've, I've had them. Mm. And I'm just like, what? And when that thought comes into play, it's just like, bam, everybody that was around me was Interpol, mm. DEA. So you just got swarmed right there. Swarmed. They uh, take me upstairs, you know, get to the, get to the room. There's already cops in the room. They're looking through all my stuff. They'd open the safe, you know, they're looking at my jewelry, my passport, money I had in there. My passport says it was used. I had traveled a lot with it. The plastic where the picture is was coming up that corner. Mm. So, you know, they smacked me a couple of times. They said, you know, this passport's fake. Where are you from? You know, are you Colombian? I'm like, listen, I'm American. You're going to ca call the embassy. You'll find out. And um, then they just take me downstairs. They put me in a car. They take me to Interpol. Interpol was right across the street from the airport. When I arrived there, you know, I'm going down this hallway and I look to the right in one of the rooms. I see the kid that brought me the drugs. They take me to a room, they sit me down, they handcuff me, and they tell me, um, you're going to have to wait a little bit. There's a DA agent that's going to come and see you. So like two hours go by, this guy shows up, young black kid. I think he was like 23, 24. American? Kid, American. Wow. American. Crazy. Yes. So he shows up. He's like, hey, what's going on? Obviously, you know why you're here. You know, we just want information. Mm. So I was like, I don't know what information I can give you. I don't know anything. He's like, come on, you know, you know something. Give me some names. I can help you out. Uh, I don't know anything. I mean, I thought I was coming to pick up money. That's what I told him. He's mm -hmm. like, oh, you want to play games? All right. He's like, you know, you're going to do like 25 years here for these drugs. You know, 
at that moment, I was like 25 years. In my head, I'm just thinking, I was like, there's no way. Yeah. I'm like, this guy's full of it. And it was for a kilo? It was, yeah, it was for a kilo yeah. of heroin. I was like, there's no way. He's like, you know, the, the America is uh, now in Ecuador, and we're going to, we go hard at drugs. Mm-hmm. So get ready. And I was like, all right. But I never gave him anything, never said a name or anything. They take me back to his holding cell in Interpol. This is, uh, I believe it was December 19th when I saw the guy from Interpol, the guy from DEA. Mm. After he leaves, they put me in a cell. There's uh, nothing in the cell. There's nobody, and I'm by myself. I'm there for the next three days, right? And nobody comes and talks to me. I got no communication, yeah. no phone calls, nothing. Until one day they come in, and they're like, all right, let's go. We're going. And I'm like, where are we going? They're like, we're going to Tulcan. It's where your case starts. Mm. Put me in the back of a pickup truck, you know, handcuffed to like some metal bar. And we're driving from Quito all the way to Tulcan through the mountains. In the back, in the of, back a truck. of a pickup truck. <laughs> the worst ride of my life. <laughs> yeah. Horrible. Dude. And the roads in Ecuador suck. suck. It's like Afghanistan, yes. dude. They're not paved. There's no huge. You're just bouncing the whole time. Yeah. You can, you can imagine how fun that ride was. Yeah. So, you know, we get to um, Tulcan. We arrive there. They take me to this place called CDP, which is like the center department of police. Mm. It's basically, it's the quartel for them. You know, it's where the, the trainees come in, you know, the new guys. And then there's like five, 600 cops there. Mm-hmm. They put me in this little like um, wooden storage unit with some metal bars. They handcuff me to there. I walk in. There's three other guys there for like local robberies. And um, they're like, oh, don't worry, bro. You're going to be good. You know, they talk to me in Spanish. They wanted to know if I knew how to speak Spanish. I was like, yeah. And they were like, oh, you know how to speak Spanish? It's crazy. You look like a, an American. Mm. So they were like, don't worry. You're going to be good. The jail here is great. You know, it's run by the Colombians. You're going to be fine. I was like, all right, cool. So I was there, I think, for two days. And then the cops come and they take me out. And they're like, all right, we're going to the jail. And you haven't been charged with anything yet? Nothing. Okay. Nothing. I haven't spoken to any lawyers. Yeah. Nothing. Are you asking for lawyers? Of course. I'm asking for a phone call, lawyers. Yeah embassy you know i want to yeah i want to know what's going on like what are we doing are you staying but, calm because i'd be freaking uh, bro, i mean i'd freaking be out. cussing out and i mean yeah. i mean i'm alone in a foreign jail in a yeah. foreign country in jail and nobody's giving me any info so of course you're freaking out right um they walk me out and they're like all right we're going to the big jail and i can hear music playing in the background salsa music this is december 24th 2001 so the the cuartel is like down the block from where their prison is in Tulcán. What is a cuartel? The uh, cuartel is like cuartel. Um, it's where the police train. Okay, and where they like put their all their cars, and yeah. you know they train the new the new uh, cadets that are coming in right. that want to be police officers. Yeah, okay. So it's like a training facility for them. Yeah, but it's huge and it's filled with cops, so obviously no one can escape from there. Mm-hmm. And then the jail is right next to it. So they're walking me down the block. I hear this music. I get to the front door. They open the door. The guards are there. They're all dressed in like um, uh, fatigue uniforms. There's a young lady guard. She's like, don't worry. You're going to be good. The music's getting louder. I'm like, what the hell's going on here? You know? They walk me down these halls. At the end of the hall, I can see like sunlight flashing through like a gate. I see like some heads moving around, people looking down towards my direction. Once we get there, I can see inside there's speakers this high on the floor in 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 the patio this is like the basketball courts mm. there's women dancing with men <laughs> salsa <laughs> right there's people drinking liquor you know they got bottles um there's pool tables there's everything so i walk in i'm just like what is this this white boy walks up to me tall white kid green eyes and he's like hey what's up white boy i look at him like you know english he's like yeah bro let's go follow me so follow this kid. We go up the steps. We walk into this cell. And this is um, all the guys that ran this jail are in this cell. So I walk in. There's this guy named Orlando. He was the guy who was like the, the caporal. Mm. So he's like, hey, what's up, man? You know, I'm Orlando. This is my wife, my kids. Everybody's inside. Um, white boy Alex was right next to me. The kid that I first saw when I walked mm. in. And they're like, all right, tell us your story. So I explain it to them. And they're like, all right, yeah, you know you've been set up, right? I said, yeah, I know. I saw the guy in Interpol. Obviously, he set me up. They're like, where is this kid? 
I was like, I don't know. They didn't bring me. They just brought me by myself. And they were like, okay, eventually he should be here. You know, you'll hopefully you'll see him soon. Okay. Can I stop you right there? Yes. Do they uh, paperwork check you when you get to South American jails the way they do in the States? There's no paperwork. I didn't have any paperwork. <laughs> There's nothing. So basically it's just your story. Yeah. Right. Okay. There's not much of paperwork checking down right. in Ecuador. Uh, what about like sex offenders? Is there any taboo around like sex yeah, crimes? Sex offenders, you're going to know immediately who they are because the guards, when they bring them in, they already let everybody know. Okay. And then, you know, whatever happens to them happens. Do they get killed? <sighs> Usually? I have, I mean, I never saw anyone get killed that was a sex offender for that reason. Just oh, for being a chomo, yeah. I didn't see him get killed for okay. that. They'll get beaten and right. they'll get treated like garbage in mm -hmm. the jail. You know, and they're washing clothes for you and, right. you know, washing dishes. And right. they're like the scum of the jail. But they're that, not, it's not like taboo the way it is. Like if you're in Cali in a maximum security prison, you can't take two steps with paperwork like that. You're getting stabbed up. Yeah. So it's not like that down there. No, not like that. I guess every Ecuador, every Latin man's had a 16 year old girlfriend at some point. So Probably. they like, they look the other way. Yeah. Okay. So interesting. So... Go ahead. So but they know this kid snitched. So. so obviously they know the kid snitched. They told me, and I was like, yeah, I know. So they were like, what do you need? And I was like, I want to make a phone call, man. So call my, you know, call my mom, call her up. Listen, you know, I'm in Ecuadorian jail. Crazy. She didn't believe me because she's hearing, you know, there's kids crying in the background. There's music. Mm -hmm. She's like, why are you lying to me? I was like, listen, <laughs> I'm not lying. You know, call the embassy. You're going to speak to this person. They'll let you know. And, you know, call me back on this number. I gave her the phone number and then I hung up. Is there cell phones at this point down yeah, there? Yeah, we got cell okay. phones inside the cell. The guy, wow. when I told him, you know, I need to make a phone call, pulled out a StarTac flip phone. Bloom. Gave it to me. With the big ass uh, antenna? Yes, the one I have to pull out. <laughs> so I made the phone call there and um, that's it. You know, let my mom know. And then once I hung up, they were like, all right, man. They were like, you know, it's visit day. Everybody's partying. You know, there's women inside this jail that are also prisoners and they're on the other side of the jail. But today they're on this side because today's, you know, December 24th, it's a huge party. Mm -hmm. We got visits, there's kids, there's women, there's everything. So go with Alex, you know, you're gonna have a great time with him. Go party, get your mind off, you know, go relax. I go with Alex and, um, and you know, we go to this room, everybody's partying, everybody's drunk, drinking, there's a plate full of cocaine and it's just, it's on from, from day one. Who's white boy Alex? Why was he in there? He's also there for trafficking. He got caught trying to smuggle uh, keys of cocaine through the border. Okay. Yeah. Where is he from? He is from Cali, and he's the one who's the English professional now. Wow. That's the guy that I was telling you about. Okay. Okay. But he's a, he's a, a, a Latin American, but he's just, yes. they call him white boy. Because he's, he's white and green eyes. Okay. Yeah. I see. Uh, wow. All right. So when do you eventually get to court? How long does that take you? Yeah, a year plus. So first, I'm in this jail for, you know, almost a whole year. I'd say about 11 months I was in Tulcan. You know, that jail was great. There was really no problems. There was really like no stabbings. There's mm -hmm. no murders. Small jail. There was like 250 prisoners mm -hmm. that were men. There was like 50 women on the other side. Uh, you could pay to go on the women's side, see your girlfriend for the day. So did they date? Did female of and course. male prisoners date? Yes, of course. Did anybody get pregnant? Yes. There were pregnant women there. <laughs> Yeah, there were people that got married in the jail. There yeah. were people that had kids. Um, Did uh, Are people there at this jail waiting for sentencing like you? Yeah, everybody. Okay. Yeah, so mostly everybody in the jail is is waiting for sentencing. Um, there's a couple of people that already got sentenced, and they're there. They're locals. Uh, I met some people, and I would ask them, like, what did you get? Well, I got eight years, but I got the two for one. I'm like, what's the two for one? Well, like, There's a law that they just took away in November 2001. You know, they were like, you're not going to get it. And I was like, what? And they were like, yeah. Before then, if you got caught and drug trafficking is like eight years, they'll give you four. So if you yeah. get caught with a murder, you kill somebody, you get 25, it's 12 and a half. 15% or know? 50%. Yeah. 50%, two mm -hmm. for one. So when I got locked up, that was taken away. I didn't have that benefit. What kind of good time? Yeah, okay. I, that's a good question. What kind of good time can you get down there or is it day for day? There's really no good time. Yeah. Yeah. I got lucky and was sent home early because I told you about Rafael Correa. Yeah. He was a president at the time and he came and actually got rid of all the foreign prisoners that had 50% of their jail time paid. 
he wanted you out because the jails were starting to get overpopulated. Yeah. So he came in, tried to clean up the jails. You know, unfortunately for me, I paid almost my whole sentence. Yeah. But I had, you know, the two escapes and a couple of other things that I got caught with, which would have, you know, made my prison sentence mm-hmm. a little bit longer. But I got lucky. Put a pin in that, fella. We're going to get to that. Yeah. Uh, so basically, the drug trafficking started to become so popular out of Ecuador that the jails were just like overcrowding. They were overcrowding. When yeah. I got there, there was uh, there was still people living by themselves. So if you're a mafioso and you got money to yeah. kick upstairs, mm-hmm. I don't want nobody in my cell. They're not assigning anybody. Mm-hmm. You live in your great cell by yourself. Yeah. You have your visit and you're chilling. Then eventually it was, oh, there's only two. Now you got to have at least another one. All right. Right. The bed that was taken off, we got, you got to put it back up. Right. Got to have a construction crew come in, build the bed again. So you got to be rich, rich Rich, to live, to live like a a kingpin. You got, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you could have everything in jail. Yeah. You could, I told you, you could buy guns, you could Mm -hmm. buy liquor, you could make liquor and you could bring in knives, whatever you want. This jail you were at the first year, how long before you saw your lawyer? Um, I got a lawyer pretty much immediately. Okay. How? So- just kind of, I got in contact, you know, people yeah. that are there, they're like, Hey, this is a yeah. good lawyer. So, and do you have money? Do you have money yeah, saved up? Yeah. I had money saved up. I also had a lawsuit that was pending that, um, six months down the line, my father had to catch a flight come down. Cause my lawsuit was, um, it had ended mm-hmm. and I was going to get paid, but I needed to sign a couple things and I wasn't there. So my father mm-hmm. had to fly and, uh, we got a notary Republic to come to the jail mm-hmm. and signed everything, stamped it. And then we were able to get that money from the lawsuit as well. Thank God. So yeah. you got money. I mean, I don't know what you do as a foreigner if you're completely indigent and you're in a foreign jail. I mean, you're just, you're, unless well, you have- I mean, that jail wasn't that bad. So the people that were there, I mean, they they showed me the ropes, basically. Yeah. They were like, listen, this jail's cool. You don't have to worry about anything here. Just, you know, do your time, relax. I know I bought a store. There was three stores there. I bought one of them and I bought a pool table. So that was generating money. Right. right? So you're, mate, you're charging people to use the pool table. Of course. You're charging people per hour to use the pool table. You got a store. So you buy at one price, sell in another. Um, and what do you, what's the store sell? Everything like munchies, you know, chips, cookies, yeah. milk, yogurts, anything you, you could get at the supermarket, we sell in the store. So it's like going to commissary exactly. in America. Yeah. And okay. on um, visit days, we would have. Uh, empanadas that mm-hmm. would get made on the streets. Mm-hmm. They would bring it inside and I would have like a, you know, like a bakery. You have yeah. that, that wooden, uh, that glass, you know, mm-hmm. spot where you have all the empanadas and yeah. people just walk up. There's visits in there. So yeah. everybody wants to buy something to eat. Are you getting laid? Of course. Yeah. Nice. You got the women in the prison next door. You could go next door or, you know, I had a girlfriend that would come and visit me. It's a good way to take your mind so off of it. So it was a great way to um, escape jail for a, a minute. How much did you pay your lawyer? Um, the first case, I think it was like eight thousand. Okay, so that's a lot of money back then. Yeah, it was to a lot. an Ecuadorian lawyer. Yes, it was a lot of money, but you also got to think about it. You know, I'm I'm getting the the American rate. Yeah, you right. Know? So no, no, but your lawyer is fighting for you, though. Yeah, he's fighting. Okay, so is he a good lawyer? So to me, he was a good lawyer. I think yeah. he did a great job. I could have gotten twelve years because um, the way they wanted to make it out was like I was this other kid's boss that was bringing the drugs. So they wanted to give me a higher sentence, yeah. but he fought for the eight years flat. Mm-hmm. So, you know, eventually I got the eight years flat for it, that. Is there any kind of mandatory minimum on quantity down in Ecuador the way there is in the U.S.? No. So it's basically just a mandatory minimum. There's people that have been caught with a ton of cocaine and they get, you know, 12 years. Yeah. So how do they decide? I how guess do they decide how much? I guess it's just How maybe, much time to give you? I guess it's maybe just the case, you know, yeah. how famous is the case? Um, you know, how much work has this guy put on the streets? How much work has he been sending to the States or Europe? You know, the, the but, but I, how do they determine what to sentence people with? Cause a kilo of heroin and a ton of cocaine are that, totally different things. I know. And that's the big problem down there. I mean, I was in jail with people that got eight years for one joint. So wow. there's really no, like their system is, is horrible, yeah. you know? There's a lot of corruption, yeah. and if you don't have the money or you don't have the lawyer, you're screwed. Right. Imagine going to jail for eight years for a joint, yeah. and I'm in the jail for eight years for a kilo. Yeah, yeah. So, um, is there any way to pay your way out? Like, just in theory, if you had, if you brought your lawyer a hundred grand, 
can you get me out and get me on a plane? Yeah. Like, that, is that possible? With that money, I'm sure I would have walked out the front door. Okay. Yeah. Most so definitely. what prevents guys like Fito and these high level gang members that are making millions a year in prison? What prevents them from just buying their way out? So it's because they don't want to go out. I'll tell you, they're, they're safer and in a better place inside than outside. So before Fito took over, there was this guy called JL. So this guy was the main guy and ran all the gangs. Now, he, for you to get close to him in jail is impossible, right? These guys, they have their own bodyguards. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got AK-47s. You can't get close to them. And there's other mobsters inside the same jail that want to take this guy's head off. You know, there's thousands of people that are willing to come in to your block to look for you and kill you mm -hmm. and set you on fire. But inside the jail, you have everyone protecting them. Mm. Now, this guy got let go. Jota went free. And he was in a shopping center in Ecuador with one bodyguard, his wife, and his two kids. And he sat down in uh, one of those mess halls like where there's buffets and stuff yeah. to eat. And I guess he's just sitting down like waiting and somebody walks up to him and shoots him. Wow. And just murked him right there on the spot. Wow. How long had he been out at that and point? And he had been out a couple weeks. Wow. You know what I mean? Yeah. So this is why they don't want to go out. I'm sure Fito, yeah. I'm sure Fito used to go out maybe every day at night. Right. No one knows. Right. You know, because they have so much money and so much power, yeah. the guards do anything for mm -hmm. them. You know? So they could have houses that they just go kick it in at night, no problem. Man, this guy had um, you know, they have roosters, mm -hmm. they have fish, they're making they have um, pools of fish where they they breed these fish inside the jail. Yeah, I don't know if you've seen it on on YouTube. I have it. They have a video where there's like a hundred pargo fishes inside of a pool in a jail. Wow! So it's a totally different society. It's just it's a it's its, it's own a, society. Yeah, it's crazy. Wow. Okay. So, uh, so you're getting to eight. You, they wanted twelve. Your lawyer got it down to eight. Yes. Uh, no good time though. No, no, no good time there. Yeah. All right. So after you get, it takes you about a year to get sentenced. So let me just rewind a little yeah. bit before I get sentenced. You know, I'm, I start selling Coke inside the jail because I want to flip mm -hmm. my money, Got a little money from my lawsuit, whatever, mm -hmm. you know, buy some cocaine, bag it up. I'm selling Coke. Okay. What year is this? So this is 2002? This is 2002. All right. So yeah. how does the Coke traffic work? How do you get put on? what's the, you know, how much do you buy at a time and what does that cost back then? Yeah. So pretty much, um, met someone inside the jail. You know, this kid's name was Triviling. We used to call him Triviling, which is goofy in English because he looks just like goofy from the character. And he had someone that, you know, could have us bring in this Coke. So, you know, paid for it, got the cocaine, got it inside the jail. How much does 50 grams I can't tell you because I don't remember exactly how much I paid. Mm. I'm sure it was dirt cheap, though. I don't think it was more than 5 or $6 a gram inside the jail. Wow. I can't tell you exactly because I don't remember. And are you using dollars yet or is it still pesos? No, it's all dollars. Okay. Ecuador was dollars when I got there. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, got the 50 grams inside. That day was a visit day. Once the visit brought in those drugs, you know, we got them out of her. She left. Oh, so she, brings, back, she smuggled yeah. it in through her. She smuggled it in. She left and we started bagging up, mm. bagged up all the Coke. You know, we put in this um, stash, which I had on the wall in the kitchen area. So there was a space where we had um, to hang up like the kitchen, the long spoon and the thing to get the stuff out of the fryer, you mm. know, when you're frying French mm -hmm. fries. So it was this wooden piece on the wall that had two nails in it. If you take one of those nails out and you move the wooden piece, there was a hole right there. Small hole where you could stick your hand in and it would dump down. That's where I would stash the drugs. So- we do that, start selling, whatever. Eventually, another visit day comes. I get another 50-pack. Comes in, bag it up, stash it in the same spot. Now, we go downstairs because it's almost time for the visits to leave. They leave at 5 p.m. Visits start at 8 a.m. in the morning, and they leave 5 p.m. So, like, 4.30-ish, go downstairs. You know, we're at the door with this girl, the one that smuggled the drugs in. We're letting her out when, bam, on the other side the police start coming in. They're coming into the patio to where the basketball mm -hmm. courts are. And everybody's on the ground, everybody to the ground, to the ground. All the visits are, you know, they're taking them out. They're putting everybody on the ground and they're running upstairs. The cops con took control of the whole prison. Now they asked for everybody to go and walk up to their cells and stand in front of the door. So me and the four other roommates I had, 
we go upstairs. I lived in the second floor and go straight to my cell. Now they asked for one of us to stand at the door while they start searching. They start ripping through everything, you know, uh, mattresses. They take mm-hmm. everything out, clothes. And um, one of the guys comes out. He's like, oh, it's clear. You know, so they go on to the next room. My heart's thumping because I know I just got a 50 pack and we just bagged it up. And there's, I don't know, like 300 bags of cocaine in there. In the stash. Yeah. In the kitchen. It's, it's a bomb mm-hmm. of cocaine. So another guard, um, another police officer comes in, young buck comes and he's like, did they check this cell already? And I tell him, I was like, yeah, they already checked it. He's like, oh, I'm going to check it again. And he goes in and he goes straight to the kitchen, just starts rummaging through like pots and pans and looking like at the, we had the, the our stove was electric. So he was like, put it upside down. He's looking at everything. And then he stands back and he starts to look because we had like wooden cabinets, cupboards. Mm-hmm. Where we put like the dishes or we put like cups and plates. So I just see him just like scanning everything and he just starts like grabbing stuff and moving and see if it moved. And he grabbed the wooden piece and it just fell. And as soon as he saw that, he looked at me and he laughed. He just smiled. Mm-hmm. He's like, <laughs> he went and called. He's like, Coronel, Colonel. Mm-hmm. And they come over. And they bring everybody inside the cell before they, they put their hand in. They put it in, he t- takes out this huge bag. So whose is it? Whose is it? Nobody said anything. I didn't say anything at the moment. And um, that's it. They took the drugs, you know. The next day, we got called to the office, director's office. And the director of the jail is like, you know, somebody has to take the fall for this. Whose is it? Nobody's going to take the fall for you. So I had to fess up, say it was mine. So all the charges I get. Why don't you guys split it? There's four of you. Why don't you each take like, you know, 20 grams? I don't think they would allow that anyway. Mm. Yeah, no. I doubt they would allow that. And you are, have you even been sentenced at this point? I wasn't even sentenced yet. Wow. Holy. So at this new charge. This is internal drug trafficking. Why in such a corrupt place are they trying to come after? It's the police. I don't know. I don't, I have no idea. Maybe it's just something that they do to train these cadets that they have over in this spot that I told you I arrived at. Yeah. So I found out eventually, yeah, that's, you know, they do that. They'll come in, they'll search everything. And that's what they do because they're practicing. Right. Right. That's what they're doing. And if you're small time, they, you, they're not worried that you're going to try to kill them. You're not a gang leader. You have no juice. No. So these are the guys they pick off. They let the big fish always go. I mean, the cops, not so much. If they're searching the jail and they find, uh, if they find a kilo in there, they find the gun, they're going to make you take your, your, your charge. You know, they're mm. going to put another case on you. Okay. You know, it's a lot different than with the guards. The guards are one thing. Right. Guards are just normal people that go and they take yeah. care of you in the jail. But the police is a whole other story. Right. Okay. All right. Uh, so yeah, it's, but it's lawless. Like it, it's, it's just like Mexico. There are laws but whether they choose to exactly. enforce them, yes. it's all arbitrary. It's, yeah. it's just bad luck. Yeah, that's bad luck. That's yeah. what it was. Mm-hmm. So get caught with that. You know, I have to say it's mine. And um, I get this new charge, internal drug trafficking. Okay. So now we have to call up a lawyer, find out what's the deal. And he said, look, man, he's like, you're looking at 12 years. You know, it, it's accumulative. I mean, it's like, um, it's how do I say? It. They're going to stack these 12 years on you. Consecutive. Yeah. Like it'll run here. They're going to stack these 12 years on you, and you're most likely going to get 8 to 12 on the other one. So he's like, I don't know what you're going to do. I was freaking out. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm 20 years old. You know, what am I looking at? Can we get, can I get out of here when I'm 40? Yeah. So that was it. You know, the, the next few months were pretty hard. Mm. You know, I was stressed. I was depressed. Mm. Um, and I want to escape. So we have, like I told you, these wooden dressers or things we put on the wall where we could put away, you know, clothes or whatever you have, your toothbrush, your personal items. So this one was actually on the roof. I'll say the roof of our room, like connected to the wall. So we could bring it down and work and cut around, make a hole, try to escape. That's what we wanted to do. Now our cell had, uh, I think it was like five or six people. One of them was a Spaniard, came from Spain, got caught trafficking and he was like 400 pounds, so he couldn't go. Mm. One of the kids that was in my cell was Colombian. I don't, know, I don't remember what exactly he bought, but he got something that we could put him to sleep. So it was like little drops. So at night when we get locked in the cell and we do like, you know, a hot chocolate or a coffee, mm-hmm. you know, cookie, sandwiches, whatever, mm-hmm. we would 
you know, yeah. put this guy to sleep. He'd eat. He'd <laughs> we'd all lay on our bunks and wait for him to go to sleep. Yeah. Once he starts snoring, boom, we're up to work. Yeah. You know what I mean? So we're working, we're working. We'd work for like an hour or two, yeah. boom, we'll cut it, and then we put it back. And we got a lookout. We got somebody watching through the window. Somebody's out the door with the mirror, you know, seeing, make yeah. sure nobody's coming. And we're working. What are you chiseling with? Do you have knives? Uh, we have a, a like a saw, like... Um, yeah, like a mini saw. Yeah, it's like a mini yeah. saw, right? It's like a mini blade, right? What we used to break through, it was like um, it was like brick. Like you put hot water on it, and it basically melts. Yeah. So it just started dissolving because these jails are so old. Yeah. You know, they're probably like over a hundred years For old. For sure. So we started throwing like water, hot water on it, and it would just dissolve. You start hitting it with like a screwdriver. We paid somebody to bring in a screwdriver, a flathead, and we could pick with that. Boom, so it's boom, essentially boom. just plaster. Yeah, like pretty really much plaster. Thick plaster. Once we break through and we could put our heads up through the hole, then we see that there's there's a whole floor of just metal like rebar. So I could see like all the way to the end of the of the hallway. Yeah. And it's just all bars. Wow. But once you get past those bars, it's just metal. Um, they're like metal sheets. So we could basically just, you know, lift it up and just crawl out under it. Wow. So I was like, all right, let's do this. We keep going, right? We cut through all the bars. It took a while. How you know, long? We couldn't do it every day either. Right. You know, we ran out of drops once. We had to wait like a week to get more. This guy, you know, is in the cell. We can't do what we want to do. Fat bastard. Yeah. So eventually the cops come in and do a, a search again. Jesus. They're going through the room. Boom, boom. They mm -hmm. grab this and they start shaking and it just falls. And I'm standing there watching. I'm just like, oh, God, bad luck. The thing fell. Mm. As soon as it falls, they turn around like, oh, you mother. And then they all got the batons. They start beating the shit out of us because they saw everything was cut. It was right. ready to go. Yeah. We're just waiting. We're basically waiting for a, a rainy day mm -hmm. where from our cell, there was a window where we could see the the guards. Um, what, are they, what do you call this? Where they they sit in. in the gun post, towers? They post the gun towers on the roof. And we could see them. And when it rains, in Tulkan, it rains a lot. Mm -hmm. So when it rains, like two, three o'clock in the morning, these guys would be face against the glass. This thing would be all foggy and yeah. they'd be knocked out. All right. So I'm like, the next, you know, when it rains, we're going to go because mm -hmm. this guy's sleeping. They're mm -hmm. always sleeping. And you could see him. So we were waiting for that. Didn't happen. We get caught. We get the beat out mm -hmm. of us. You know, they beat us with batons. They closed the cell door. All of us had to go to separate cells. And uh, pretty much they were like, you know, you're going to get transferred soon. Okay. So they don't give you another charge though, at least. Um, yeah. It's uh, and uh, you're trying to escape. But did they give you an escape? More yes. Time stacked onto? Yes. That's another, it's oh, another wow. charge. That's another six months in, in prison. Okay. Right. So it's like, I don't know. What do they call them here? When you get like different charges put on you. Yeah. Just in. Just a different charge. Yeah. All right. So yeah, I got a different charge. Mm -hmm. It's six months added to your sentence. Okay. All right. So worth it though. If you got of course 20, it's worth it. Yeah. Six I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm not trying to kill anybody. You yeah. know, I'm just trying to leave. Mm -hmm. I just want to get out of there. So after that, you know, I think a couple of days go by and I hear the locks in the keys. It's like three in the morning. I'm already panicked. I'm thinking like, where are they going to take me? Bam. I hear the locks. I get up real quick, put the mirror out and I look and I see here come the Ninja Turtles all suited up, mm -hmm. you know, black mask, black helmet, mm -hmm. the vest, all yeah. that. Boom, they come straight to the door, open up. Castro, let's go. They take me out, they tell me to get on my knees. They put toilet paper around my face and then duct tape it. <laughs> so I got, you know, I can't see anything. Boom, they walk me out. And they throw me on the back of the pickup truck again at yeah. like 2 3 in the morning. Where are we going? Quito. Now I'm going back. Yeah. So we get there in the morning, you know. As we're getting there, we stopped for breakfast first. It was already at sunrise. It already come up. We stopped for breakfast. We ate something. While well, you're then, blindfolded? Yeah. Well, they took it off. Oh, okay. Yeah. They do that just in case I try to escape or someone tries to come and rescue you. Mm. You can't see anything. Mm. But once we got to where we ate, it was like down the block from the prison. Mm -hmm. They cut it off. I see. And they invited me inside to eat. Okay. So we sat down. We ate breakfast. And I could see the prison from where I was. Mm. And... um after we ate, you know, they took me inside the prison. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a head guard waiting for me and all his guards there. They're like, yeah, these, this guy tried to escape. And they're like, oh, yeah, all right. Take him to the hole. And when I go to walk up, there's just all guards lined up the stairs. The, the hole was like four floors up. 
and there's just all guards up the steps, just kicking you, hitting you, batons. I'd fall, I'd trip, get back up, keep running, and they're just yelling at you like, go, go, go. Whoa. Crazy. And then I get to this gate where I can't go anymore, and then a couple of them walk up, and they open up the gate, and it's like a, like a horror movie. Like this long hallway, the lights like flickering on and off, smells bad, mm -hmm. cold. And um, I get there, and they open up the door. Inside, I guess they were still sleeping, it's like pitch black, and I hear somebody say, turn the lights on, turn the lights on, because they're opening up the door. And um, they put the light on. It's like they have to connect like these wires. I remember I, I saw the, the zzz mm -hmm. from the, you know, the connection, mm -hmm. and then the light came on, and I looked around. I'm like, what the hell is this? Like the, It was like so hot and humid. The walls are sweating, mm -hmm. right? There was like five or six people on the floor. There were six cement beds, right? So- they were they were stacked up like bunk beds, and um, and then I hear white boy, and I look, and it's not Alex, but this this other kid, his name was Alex as well. He was from Queens, wow. and I look and he's like, "What's up, bro?" He's like, "American." I'm like, "Yeah." He's like, "Oh, bro, come over here." So I go, I sit down. I'm like, "Bro, I'm so happy to see you. Mm. You can't imagine how happy I am." Yeah. And he's like, "What are you here for?" So I was like, "I tried to escape from Tulcan. They brought me here." He's like, "Oh." You know, I had a relationship with the psychiatrist upstairs. You know, I got her to bring me in a, poli a police uniform. And when they were doing their shift change, he uh, walked out with them. Right. And he walked through two doors until he got to the third one. He walks out that third door. And then the other shift is coming in and they see him. They tackle him to the ground. Yeah. Crazy. Almost made it. They beat wow. the living hell out of him. The kid was all black and blue mm. in the face, arms, legs. Cause they love to beat you down there. So that's, that's really what you get up down there for is if you try to escape. Yeah. So what else gets you sent to the hole in a prison like that? Stabbing, extortion. Yeah. If you're extorting somebody, they snitch on you. Boom. You're going to the hole. Mm -hmm. Stab somebody. You're going to the hole. Mm -hmm. um, fights. They don't really fight down there. Down there. It's, you know, yeah. you want to fight. It's going to be a knife fight. Yeah. You know, you're going to yep. get stabbed up real quick. Mm -hmm. You know, if the situation's a lot more serious. Maybe you're someone that has some weight to your name. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to get shot because they're not going to mess around. You know, so the guards will have you killed down there? Um, I've seen guards open doors for you to get killed. Right. Yeah. They're right. corrupt. In that way, yes. A guard won't kill you. I saw a guard get killed on B Block. What you happened know, there? He uh, he took one of the prisoner's wives. Basically, just, you know, followed her, you know, was, you know, talking to her. And then she ended up going with him. Wow. And this guy actually had the balls to come and walk the yard. And the person he took, you know, his girl... He stabbed them like 30 times and killed them, and right? You, right on the yard. In you front of everybody, this? yeah. In front of everybody. Yeah. And then it, once he was on the ground, he had a, a vest on, but he ran up on him and just started sticking him like in the neck. And then when he fell to the ground, he lifted up the vest and just finished him. You know, um, we had a soccer game where my mother was there present on a visit day. You know, someone got murked there playing soccer. They got caught an elbow. The other kid threw another elbow. They stood up like they were going to fight. You know, one pulled out a, a shank. The other one pulled out a real like steak knife. But the one with the shank that was like a, like a, like a ice pick stuck him first right in the heart. The kid just dropped Fuck. dead. Yeah. In yeah. front of his, it's front of yeah. everybody. Yeah. Insane. Yeah. So there's really no respect for life. Animals down there. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So what prison is this in? So Quito? that's What's in it called? Uh, Ex Penal Garcia Moreno. Right. Yeah, that's that's the prison that I ended up in and did the rest of okay. my years there. All right, so now you're here. And this is your home. Yeah, this is my home for the next, uh, I didn't know how many years. So when did you finally get your sentence? So I was taken back and forth for my first trial for the international drug trafficking yeah. twice. Yeah. So they took me back to Tulcan because that's where the case started. Yeah. And we had, I believe it was two, two times I went for that. And when I came back... Um, I already came back with my sentence the second time. Mm. They gave me eight flat. Yeah. So I was happy about the eight. Still, you know. But now I, you're, you're still fighting the internal drug I'm still drug fighting the internal drug trafficking charge. So just so happens that that case is still going, and I'm still involved with this girl I met in Tulcan. She went to visit me. You know, we got serious. She would come and visit me all the time. Now, When you're fighting a case, a drug case down there, are there like plea deals the way there are from the prosecutors in the States? When I, I never got any offers. Okay. I mean, I don't think they plea deal down there. Like, can you, so did you take your case to trial? I, yeah, I, okay. I went to trial. I had a lawyer, yeah. you know, okay. I ended up, you know, 
trying drugs, um, pasta base, start smoking it. My lawyer was like, listen, you start smoking this stuff, get skinny, look like a drug addict, because that's where we want to pull this off as, as you're a consumer. You know, oh. you have all these drugs because you bought them, you bought a lot to have it once, and this is yours. You're a drug addict, and, you know, you're not selling this stuff. Right. You know? So he told you to get become a drug addict? Of course. And did you become one? So that's what we did. Oh. We started smoking base, and then- Got hooked on it. You just lose a bunch of weight? Lost a ton of weight. Yeah. Wow. Crazy. Damn. Tell us about base. What is so, base? Base is basically the garbage from uh, cocaine. So I don't know if you know when they cook it, you know, coke rises, everything that falls and stays at the bottom of the pan is is the garbage, which is oh. la base. Yeah. Now, and, and that makes crack look like uh, yeah, alkaline and, water. Yeah, pretty much. It makes it look like- uh, oh. Like nothing, yeah. Because no, this like, is strong stuff. Yeah, no, this is you know? this will mess you up permanently. Yeah, were there a lot of base heads? Yes. What do you call them? Like crackheads? Basuqueros. Basuqueros. Yeah, basuqueros. So I imagine Ecuadorian prisons are just filled, filled with basuqueros, and these are people. You know, most of them, I'd say eighty percent of them, don't have anyone that that's going to visit them. Mm -hmm. You know, um, they have big sentences, mm -hmm. so they might not go home. And then some of them just don't care because they have no one on the outside. They become a basuquero and then, you know, you want to hit somebody, you know, give me 500. You could have a body for 500 back in the day. Dude. So if you need somebody killed, you just go to a basuquero. They'll take care of it. They, I mean, they, not all of them, but there was plenty of them. Yeah. They don't care know? if they ever, ever, ever go home. Exactly. Okay. So what is, and they're selling basuquero. They're making a lot of money. Yeah. There's, there's places inside the jail where you could go, like there was a, a cell that was converted into a store mm -hmm. and this guy's name was crazy. Freddie. He was in B block. So everyone called him loco Freddie. You would go straight to his store you go up and he'll give you five packs for a dollar. Oh, they were the biggest gosh. packs inside the jail and all the guards and everybody in the jail knew he was selling, mm -hmm. but that's what the guy does. Yeah. You know, and he's been in jail for the past 20 years, mm. you know, and that's what he does. He's got a store and he sells drugs. And he pays the guards. He pays the guards. Everybody yeah. gets their cut. You know, right. the head guard gets 10, each guard gets a buck and they all live happily because remember like this guy, Freddie, there's other people that sell drugs. Mm -hmm. You know, back in the day, it wasn't, um, too many like gangs or mafias, but right. it, was, it was like the wild, wild west. Everybody's right. looking out for themselves. You know, there might be this gang or, yeah. you know, we were a gang outside. We used to rob banks and Brinks trucks, things like yeah. that. Five or six of them, they'll gang up inside and be like a tight click, but there wasn't gangs like there is now. Okay. So when did the hierarchy of gangs start to form? Did you see that towards the end I of your stretch? I didn't see that. No. Okay. The people that are in charge of the gangs now in Ecuador, I saw when they came to the jails, Right. When they were in prison for the first time, like this guy Fito got locked up in 2008. Now I was there, right? But they weren't big names right. back then. How did they become big names? So they became big names because these are people that have gangs outside mm -hmm. by the seaports in Guayaquil, Machala, Vince, you know, all these places. And they control them. And right. their gangs are still outside in the streets. Mm -hmm. So- from inside the jail, they control everything. Yeah. So, and how did they rise to prominence? Explain how they became so, so rich So Mexicans and started getting locked up. I'm talking about Mexicans as like drug lords mm -hmm. or people with like a thousand keys, 2000 keys. And once these people get into the jails, you know, they're looking for the big timers inside, mm -hmm. you know, the big guys, the guys that are running blocks, you know, guys that are making four or five grand a day. So they look for these people and then obviously they're going to talk to them. Mm -hmm. I can get these drugs. You know, we could get connected. We got connections with the cartel. You want to make money. We need the ports. You guys got the gang and the power outside. Right. And then you control how many thousands of people in here. Right. Let's put, let's put everybody on drugs. Right. You know, let's get all these keys in here. Mm -hmm. How many kilos can we smuggle? How many guards can we mm -hmm. get on payroll? You know, that's the way it works. Now. So really it all came from Mexican cartels. The, the power structure in Ecuador yes. now. Yes. Now it's it's basically run like the cartels were run back in the day. Mm -hmm. Remember when Mexico was insane, there was people yeah. getting heads chopped off, thrown yeah. over bridges. Ecuador is like that. Yeah. Now. So the, the Ecuadorian gangs are the ones who have access and control of the ports. And then they're supplied by the Mexicans. Cartels. Who are getting it from Colombia, which is so crazy. Crazy. They are actually bigger than the Colombians inside of Colombia and Ecuador. It's crazy how they just took over, right? It's crazy. There's so much money. Okay, so, but, but but when you were locked up, it was basically just freelancers. Freelancers, everybody selling, yeah. you know, people making liquor. What I mean, was the key to come up 
as a drug dealer in the prison back then? You got to know the right people. So you had to ha have the best connections on the outside? No, in the inside. Because remember, oh. say like, I, I used to sell uh, liquor, right? Mm -hmm. But you know, a white boy from America, you know, how am I selling liquor? Why? Because I'm connected with the right people, you know, because I know people on the inside, you know, and they're cool with me. And so nobody's messing with me. But if I didn't know the right people, I'm not going to be able to sell liquor. They might run up in your cell and take everything right. you got. You saw the pictures I got. Yeah. I got a TV. I got my PlayStation. We're making liquor. You know, not everybody could have that. Inside. Okay. So what did tell us about your liquor operation? Um, so, I mean, pretty much um, 10 pounds of sugar, some yeast. We get the guards to bring in, you know, pineapple, uh, oranges, anything mm -hmm. to add some flavor. We'll throw it in the bucket, maybe under my bed or in a different cell. Mm -hmm. And we just let it ferment for, you know, eight to 10 days. Then we had the contraption where we put it inside, let it boil up, you know, all the vapors rise, basically like making moonshine. Yeah. And um, you could sell those uh, bottles for $20 every two liter bottle of Coke. How much to, to make that whole vat? How much does all the, the processing? The ingredients? No, everything. Uh, you mean uh, the cost? Yeah. You're oh, very low. Okay. Probably like uh, 30 bucks. Total, and you can yeah. sell one bottle for for one bottle for twenty. You'd get like four bottles out of each bucket. Okay, yeah, and okay. then you could cut it down because it comes out pure. So you throw some water in it. Right. You know, out of four bottles, you might get five, five and a half. Okay, so you're making how much on a visit day? You can make a hundred bucks. Yeah. You know, I mean, for back then and inside the jail is good. Yeah, in Ecuador, a hundred bucks goes. And then a long if way. you're doing this three or four times a week, yeah, you're making dough. Right. Okay. So that was what you stuck with. Was that your main hustle? That was my hustle, yeah, for a little while. Um, once I got caught with, uh, I got a tunnel, I got caught, I got sent to F block. Oh yeah, so tell me before we get into that, yeah, um, what did did you know your sentence uh, that when you took it to trial? Did that work? Did they buy that you were just a, a drug head, a drug addict? So yeah, so I pretty much you know became a drug addict, lost a ton of weight, took it to trial, went there. And the girl I was seeing in Tulkan at the time, she had an uncle that was a judge in the Supreme Court where I'm taking my case. So as you can imagine, spoke to her. She got in contact with him. You know, some money was paid to him mm -hmm. and he was able to take that off. How so much money? It was uh, like eight, another 8,000. So if you had came in there- Without money, you're, you're beat. But if I, if me, I had like hundreds of thousands to my yeah, name yeah. back then. If I had gone if in there, I could have walked, walked out. When I walked in the jail, like the small jail in Tulcan, mm -hmm. and you had a hundred grand on you, you would have walked out the jail because you would have talked to a couple of guards, be like, listen, I got 50 here, 50 outside. Yeah. You know, just walk me out and I'll take you straight to the right. money. You, you would have probably been gone. Because eight grand paid off a judge. Yes. A Supreme Court judge. <laughs> like, like, a, like a top level. You know? Wow. Okay. So he got it reduced to. He got it taken away, like expunged, because I was a drug addict. Okay. So, so then you're left with my eight years flat. Okay. So that's how you got the internal drug charge taken, taken, away. taken away. Yes. <laughs> Boom. So we can do eight. Yeah. This we sounds can like do a party. Eight. We okay. can do eight. Uh, and you're still a young guy. Yeah. Okay. So, so you're in now, you're in prison. You know at least how much time you got to do. Um, did you ever have a, a knife on you? Did you ever feel oh, always? Yeah. Okay. Knives, guns. I mean, you could have anything inside, but what did you have? Well, I had a knife and a gun. What kind of gun did you have? A 38. <laughs> you could have it in the cell. Yeah. You keep it in the TV. I mean, it's not something you walk around with yeah. every day, but you have them. A lot of people have them. It's and a normal thing. How much did you pay for it? 300. That's what you pay for a gun in America. That's I mean, crazy. this is probably a stolen gun. I mean, I don't know where they get it from, but Wh it's in the inside. I got it from another prisoner inside. Okay. And when do you bring the guns out? When there's a riot. Okay. Everybody's gunned up. You remember the first riot? Yeah. we. I lived through three of them. All right. So the first one, um, I believe it was 2003. It was so they could get back the two for one law. So what they did was it was a visit day. You know, all these thousands of visitors came in the prison. Yeah. And what they did was they... Um, kidnap the guards at the door. So when the guard opened up the door to let the visit mm -hmm. in, after enough visits had come in, they walked up to the gate and they were just waiting for the guard to open up for the new visits to come in. And the chosen ones walked down, just, you know, 
gun to his waist, boom, give me the keys. Come on, let's go inside. Mm -hmm. You know, they just kidnap you. I yeah. mean, what's the guard going to do? Yeah. He's not going to do anything. So he just froze up. They, you know, they bring him inside. They lock the gates. Mm -hmm. And then it's on. Everybody in the jail knows when it's going to happen. Yeah. You know, everybody that somebody knows. So you know everybody's, you know, getting ready. Everybody's taking out their guns, knives, machetes. Because when it's a riot, it's not only, you know, everybody says it was for the two for one. But people are going hunting. Yeah. You know, because it's, you know, this guy hates this guy. You know, these this group doesn't get along with this group. We're going into this block. We want to go steal. We yeah. want to rob. I need a TV. Yeah. I need a fridge. Who's got one? So what's you your know, goal like that. as a guy who's a non-affiliate, a foreigner? You're just trying to survive. Survival, man. That's it. So you know? do you stay in your cell when it's popping off with your gun ready? No. I mean, I knew, I knew a bunch of people that were connected, well-connected mm -hmm. inside the jail. So I was able to walk outside plus in a riot you can't see anybody's face everybody's masked up like a t-shirt holes in the eyes and boom 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 and everybody's just masked up oh. you can't tell who's who's who anywhere and there's no people lights just, people are walking around, people with, are their walking guns around out. with guns people are walking around with knives in their hands you know after they they took over the guards and they kidnapped that one guard they had these um you know the metal barrels that they use like trash cans down there threw them all up against the gates and they lit everything on fire. Like they had a bunch of garbage in and they lit it. So it'll like weld the doors shut. Wow. So this way they couldn't get in. So they had all the garbage cans up against the doors. Everything's lit up. Who's the orchestrating this? Everybody. I mean, it's like, it's all the top guys in the jail. They'll yeah. get together, you know, let's do this. Let's, yeah. let's do the ride. Let's pop it off while the visits are inside. Yeah. So this way they can't come inside and harm us. You know right, because I mean? there's a bunch of civilians. There's there. kids, there's women, mm -hmm. and there's everything. So, and they make a call to Congress saying we want the two for one yeah, back? Yeah, it, it's basically they're in no negotiation all day, but I mean, never really anything came out of it. What happened, what happened during the riot? Well, the riots, like I told you, it was just, you know, it was like hunting season. Um, you'd walk by a cell, you'd see a dead body, and you'd walk by another cell, this one would be lit on fire. I mean, it was craziness. You'd see people running down the hall with like a TV, they're breaking walls, trying to get into maximum security, you know, inside maximum where there's like white collar crimes, mm -hmm. like say like where the president, Lucio Gutierrez was, mm -hmm. they have everything in there. Right. You know, they have big screen TVs, great furniture. They live like in a hotel, right. refrigerators. So also oh, they don't even put uh, dangerous people in maximum. No, no, that, no, that was a maximum for white collar. Crimes. Okay. I see. Like political people, right. white collar. Now the super max is for different kind of people right. and it's a different area of the jail. But this part is where they keep like upper level traffickers. Say yeah. this guy was a capo and he paid, you know, 50 grand right. to just go in and, and stay in this block. Yeah. Nobody's going to bother you. Right. Cause it's separated from general population. Yeah. That's where but, I want to be. But they started breaking down the walls. Wow. And then once they broke through, they start shooting from that side this way. And then these guys into maximum, everybody's shooting until they ran out of bullets. It was probably like two days, you know, a gun battle. And then no more bullets. They're not shooting anymore. All right, let's keep breaking. Bloom, bloom. They're just breaking, breaking, breaking until we got through. And then everybody's going in. I masked up. I took a fridge out, put it on my cell. You know, we're just rummaging through what, everything. What happened to the guys in Maximum? Um, a couple got killed. A couple got hurt. You know, some were getting extorted. I mean, I'm did, not, did some guys just say, hey, take it when they, when oh, they got through? Of course. Through? No, everybody said, just take it. Yeah. Yeah. When you get we there. We give up. But yeah, pretty much because the people that are in there are, are not murderers. Yeah. You know, these are uh, upper level traffickers mm -hmm. that, you know, they're, they're not killing anybody, mm -hmm. but they just want to live well inside. So the some jail. of them got shot to death. Some of them got battle. shot. Some of them got stabbed. You know, some people, nothing happened because they just gave up. Yeah. And some people they knew, yeah. you know, some people are known. So, you know, touched, but it, it was insane. Did you have to shoot? Do you have to bust your gun? I'm not, no, I never shot that, okay. that, that riot. I never shot anybody. We were just looking for stuff to take. We're basically going in, you know, we're taking, oh, look at this guy. He's got a great fridge. I, I need it. Fucking took it out, put it in my cell. Well, what are, what's the matter with you? Like you, you've gotten in so much trouble already. You're living well from your liquor business. Like why did you feel like you had to join in the mayhem? Because that's what everybody's doing. I mean, if you're not, I it's mean, like a mass psychosis. But if you're not doing it, then like this, then look at this guy. He's, he's locked up in a cell. What's wrong with this kid? You know what I mean? Like you gotta be part of, you gotta be in, in the. So, so you look weak if you just. Course. Stay in your cell. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So if you're, you're staying in your cell, okay. you're, you're weak. Yeah. Okay. And that could maybe open uh, open you up to maybe extortion. someone will come to my door and start shooting through the window. I mean, right. who knows? Right. So you it's know? safer to be out. It's safer to be out and about. I see. You know, this I way see. nobody, because everyone knows where you live. 
You know, wow. you know, I live in cell nine. Maybe you want to, you want to do something to me. You're going to go to my cell, but you're not going to find me. Cause I'm, a, right. I'm, I'm cruising the town inside, you know, masked up. How with, many people got boys. killed during this riot? Oh, I couldn't say, uh, it was probably like, I would say like 15 to 20, maybe the first riot, something like that. And that's light. Yeah, that was light. Sometimes yeah, compared hundreds to now, of people compared get to now. Yeah. Now it's hundreds. Okay. And how, how did that end? How'd that finally end? with the uh, the police and the national guard mm-hmm. bum rushing us you know um throwing uh gas inside yeah. the jail it was just crazy okay yeah uh did anybody get new charges from the um from the riot i would say probably the guys that committed the kidnapping to the guard because right. they do it you know no mask on nothing yeah. but they don't care because these are people that'll take those charges right yeah. okay and the guard didn't get killed no he they released killed. the guard they released well, them, that's yeah. nice of them yeah yeah um there was okay. even guards like guards that were cool with you know with everybody and would be like listen we're gonna strap this uh gas tank on you and we're gonna take you out to the patio because there was cameras you know the film crews were up on the mountain like filming down helicopters rolling around above you know so guards like crucified like this like on a weight bench with a gas tank on them we got people with gas tanks with the the flames coming out you know i mean just like insane movie this is all footage that you can look up and you can find. Yeah. Oh, I imagine now everybody's got smartphones. They're making uh, TikTok videos out of no, this. No, now, now it's, yeah. When I was there, the phones didn't have cameras. Right, right. If not, it would have been all over. the. But know. now you see stuff still now I get sent see, to you. Yeah, I could see, you know, the block. I could see the people outside. I could see my boy cutting up bricks of weed that yeah. they bring in and they're all compressed. Yeah. So he has to get his knife and cut them up. He sends me pictures, you yeah. know, smoking a J in the cell. Yeah. Okay, so... Uh, and you were in three of those riots, three of them. What yeah. was the worst one? You think, uh, I would say the third one was the worst one. All the jails united because where I was, uh, general population was three blocks. It was B, C, and D. Then we had a for the white collars, which was the maximum that we broke into in the first one. Mm-hmm. Then we had E block, which was for like, um, for like the scum of the jail for like the pedophiles yeah. and you know, all the chomos, whatever they all lived in there. And then there was jail three, which was another part of the jail. And then there was F block maximum security, like the super max where all the killers and, you know, the tougher people went. Right. That, that third riot, the whole jail united and you were walking around, you would see dead bodies on the floor. It was just crazy. What do you mean united? Like, like everybody, all the walls were broken. Right. So like, um, so everything was connected. Everything was all connected. All the wings were connected. All the wings, all the entire jail. We even took over the offices. The offices got lit on fire. You know, all the files and everything of people that were in prison there, they lit everything on fire. Did everything guards get lit. killed? No, I don't think they killed any guards. There was a bunch kidnapped inside, so they wouldn't come in, mm-hmm. you know, and try to hurt us. So we had, I think there was like 10 or 15 guards and it was crazy. Are there gun towers in these yes, prisons? all over. And yeah. do they take shots at you? Like in, in the States, if you're stabbing somebody, they'll no. shoot to kill you. They no, don't they, do that down no, there. No, they don't do that. They'll, Why? they'll sit there and watch it. They, they only shoot to kill if they see you like escaping. You're like trying to jump over the wall or something, yeah. then they'll shoot you. Right. That's the yeah. only thing they care That's about. That's the only thing. Yeah. And is it just because they're lazy? It's This is Latin America. They don't give I, a Listen, I would say it's because they're scared, man. Yeah. I mean, they got to live there. They're, yeah. they're living there more than us. Yeah. At the end of the day, we're there chilling, doing whatever we got to do, paying yeah. our time. Yeah. They got to take care of us. Yeah. And then they got to deal with all these killers and the, mm-hmm. you know all these bad people. They got to walk light. Yeah. You know, because they come inside, they know, you know they know somebody will, will kill you for, for nothing. Right. But they don't get killed in the riots maybe because the, the inmates need them for the they, drug yeah, trafficking. We need them also for safety. Yeah. You know, did, did they, they work? Did you know of any, know of any instances where the guards were working for the gangs in there? Well, a lot of guards work for different people. A lot of individuals. I mean, the guards are the ones that bring in everything. Mm. They bring in the guns, the drugs, anything you could think of. You just got to pay him. That's all. So that last third riot was crazy. There was the worst riot. There was the most dead bodies I've seen. The smell was horrible. And there were just fires everywhere. No lights. They cut off the electricity on us wow. after like the fifth or sixth day. So there was no electricity. Um, there was really no food for a couple of days. The drugs ran out. It was horrible. Did you yeah. ever get shot or People stabbed? People were going crazy. I got stabbed. What was Not that in about? a riot, but that was when I got caught with the tunnel. You never got shot at? No, I didn't get shot at, yes, but I didn't get shot. What was that about? I mean, it's just... it's In a riot? Yeah, it's in a riot. You know, people are shooting. You don't know what the hell's going on. You got to shoot back, you know. One side shooting at another. 
and you're with your team. <laughs> I mean, it's it's just. <sighs> so you in a riot in Ecuador, you shoot until the bullets run out. Of course. And yeah. then later on, the guards bring in more bullets. Yeah. The, guard, the guards will bring in everything. Mm. That's the only reason. The jails are filled with that, with drugs, with guns, knives. Did you have That's a vest on? Like, did you ever go no. out? There were some people with vests there. I never had a vest. Mm. I believe on the third riot, they got the vest because we took over like the entire jail and the spot where the guards would sleep and rest. And there was vest there. So mm. I saw some people walking around with vests, which was shocking to me. But yeah. Were there any foreigners, like real white people? Me. Was there anybody that looked like and acted oh, like yeah, me? Yeah, of course. Yeah. That didn't want to participate, that just wanted to f sit it out. Yeah, I know this kid. He lives currently in North Carolina. His name is Danny. We call him Nieve because yeah. he's white snow. as snow. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, he was neutral. And, and yeah. But in a riot, what does a neutral guy like he Danny just, do? He just stays in the cell all day. Yeah, and just yeah. prays. He just prays. <laughs> he's just hidden, basically. You right. Know, not in his cell, but in someone else's right. cell. Probably just chilling, you know. Hey, somebody, like, let me, Yo, bro, like, just let me stay here, yeah. please. All right, you got it. Just go inside. Don't make any noise. Wow, that's it. Imagine then, the terror. And he, the thing, yeah, the he thing hears is, the screams and the bullets. The thing is that oh. you can lock your own cell. You have your own locks. Oh. So I had my own lock. So I'd walk out of my cell. I close the door and I put my lock on it. Right. With, and I had my key on me. Okay, so you can lock up your cell. It's just if they try to get in there for some reason, they could break the door down probably. Yes. But nobody's right. really going to do that unless there's a good reason. Yeah. Because they got other, they got bigger beefs than yep. Nieve. Yeah. Wow. That's, so you could just push somebody into your cell, kill them, lock the door. During a riot? Yes. Dismember them? Yes. What was like the wildest you heard about happening in one of those riots? Um, like blew your mind. In F Block at the Supermax, somebody got murdered and left in the cell. And they cut his hand off. So when you walk by the cell, they left his hand just on the front door. And so you walk, everybody would walk by like, oh, did you walk by cell three? Yeah, yeah, I saw it too. Everybody <laughs> saw it. And the guy was just dead inside, like the pool of blood was coming out. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Did you have to go like to therapy when you got home eventually? So yeah, my parents thought, you know, that would be a good idea. I didn't want to go to therapy because I just think, you know, they, they try to drug you with pills. And I didn't really want to know anything about, you know, any chemical drug. You yeah. Know, I just, you know, promised the Lord when I got out, please yeah. help me get out. I'll never go back to any of this. Yeah. You know, I just want to stay straight and narrow and just live a good life. Okay. Okay. You know? So you, you got straightened out in there. Yeah. I don't want to go back to jail. Yeah. Um, what therapist are you going to? I go to better help. It's online. They've never tried to drug me. Um, I just, I have a friend of mine that lives in the Bronx he yeah. went to therapy and they started giving him pills. Oh, he went to a psychiatrist. He went to a psychiatrist. Ah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, I heard that story and I was like, ah, no, but, I but, don't want it. But did you have like PTSD when you got out? I like, mean, of course. I mean, yeah. I have it till this day. Mm -hmm. You know, anywhere I go in, I'm always aware of my surroundings. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like I, I could read people a lot better mm -hmm. from all the things I lived inside the jails. Yeah. You know, like you can feel like when something's going to happen, yeah. you can feel attention or you can read people's attitudes, yeah. things like that. So I just think it's, you know, it's helped, you know, yeah. all the trauma I've been through, I think it's made me a better person. I know how to read people. I know how to, you know, maneuver through certain situations. Mm. So I just feel like it helped me. Yeah. You know, I try not to think about the negativity and, you know, all the bad things that happened to me and things like that. I just feel it should make me a better person. Yeah. Well, yeah. it sounds like you was pretty much escaped unscathed except for getting stabbed. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's get into that. Like, tell us about this tunnel. So on the second uh, riot, we started making the tunnel. We knew this riot was going to be long um, because it was projected to go over a month. Okay. So how we, long in advance do you know before the riot kicks off? Probably like a week. Okay. Yeah. Something like that. So you and who else are trying and just to sell mates. Okay. You know, we're doing the tunnel. Yeah. Um, one of the guys was a Colombian. He was, he already had prior knowledge of doing a tunnel. So and he's like, this is what we're going to do. Um, instead of going through the floor, we went through the side wall. So the side walls between one cell to another, they're about like three and a half four feet wide. Mm -hmm. So this way you could go through the sidewall and then go down, down the shaft, down the right. shaft. So, um, what's your plan if you escape? Like what, what are you thinking if you actually successfully get out? So we would have gotten out, I would have taken a car, hopefully to Columbia uh -huh. 
or any other country. And yeah. At the time, I was thinking just get to an embassy and get a, yeah. get a passport and just leave. Yeah. You know? And they probably would have, too. Yeah, most definitely. I, yeah. Mean, I lost my passport. I'm American. Yeah. How you doing? And, you know, help me out. Uh-huh. <laughs> right. You know, a young white kid, I'm pretty sure they would have helped me out. Mm. Did if, you write, were your parents, like, writing letters to, like, diplomats uh, in America or, you know, like the embassy in Ecuador, like, Hey, this is an American citizen. He's suffering, you know, grave. Yeah. Like, c- can you extradite him? Can you come to some kind of agreement where he can do his time in the States? That's like, funny. They- That's funny. You asked that because when I was arrested and the embassy went down there, so I'm gonna rewind when my mother spoke to, um, spoke with the embassy. She said she wanted to go down to see me mm-hmm. when she knew it was real 100% what was happening. And they were like, listen, you can't go over there. It's crazy. And there's all the gorillas over there. Yeah. You know, we're going to go there and we're going to take a helicopter. We're going to go see how it is. And then we'll let you know. And then my mother calls me and tells me, she's like, oh my God, where are you? I just spoke to this lady. She told me it's like warfare down there. Where did you go? So the embassy takes a helicopter, you know, they get to um, Tulkan. They come to see me. They call me out. I come out dressed, you know normal chain watch sneakers I remember, I remember the lady's face when i walked in she started looking at me she's like you don't look too bad and right. i was like no nah. i was like why you say that she was like you look great and i was like thanks so um getting back to your question i wanted to get extradited back to the states yeah yeah and i was like yeah i don't want to be here i was like my family's you know five thousand miles away yeah is there any way i could get extradited back and um she was like sure no problem we'll we'll uh We'll yeah. see what we could do. And is this uh, the lady that took the helicopter over? Is yes. this an American? She's an American. Okay. She works with the embassy. I see. And she came with two bodyguards. Mm. All right. And um, she pretty much told me, you know, we'll do whatever we can to help you out and get you back to the States. Right. And my mother was like, all right, great. You know, she was happy uh, as well. And, you should have um, been like, I, I, they're butt <laughs> me all day. This is terrible. <laughs> but you were, yeah, you were not, that wasn't the case. Now, yeah. if they, maybe if you've been in prison in Quito, that's like a refugee situation. Yeah, almost, yeah it was different. You know? But, um, but they just denied it. So America was going to let me come back and Ecuador didn't allow it. Yeah. Ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, you got to get to Colombia because America and Colombia are super linked they probably, you probably could have been like, Hey, I escaped prison, you know, like, let me go back to the state. You probably could have turned yourself in even to like the DEA there. Maybe. Yeah. But your, your plan was to go to an embassy in Colombia. Yeah. And that was the plan or plan B was to you know, travel to, to Uruguay and just go hide out there. Right. Do you, you have, know? you have family there? Yeah. We got family over right, there. Right. Yeah. Right. And just figure out how to get home. Yeah. Okay. So you're tunneling. So yeah, we're tunneling, you know, um, Day by day, like I said, you know, this, this building is like 180 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, using water, this this block just disintegrates. We have huge sink inside the cell, so as we take chunks off, it's going to the sink. Somebody's working it, wow. you know, crushing it down with yeah. the hot water on, yeah. and it's just disappearing. Bigger chunks we'd have to save, yeah. you know, like I put under my bed, mm-hmm. and we take out at night during the riot when there wasn't too many people around, mm-hmm. and we take it outside and break it down in these huge wash sinks that were in the patio, and they would dissolve better, and there was bigger holes like drains yeah. where we could throw the stuff down. Like all the, this rock would basically turn into dirt, yeah. and it was just disintegrating. So, you know, after, I don't know, a good 30 days, we were um, we were we were ready to go, but just so happens the the riot is going to stop. Mm. We get word, so we have to work fast to cover it up. Yeah, you know we got to cover back this hole on the wall. Mm-hmm. You know we got to find a way to get newspaper. Mm-hmm. You know plaster it up, yeah. and then we throw the fridge right back up against this hole. So when the guards come in. You know, because I had multiple searches after that. Yeah. Like even after the riot, yeah. when all the police and everybody comes in, you know, everybody's out in the patio and boxers face right. on the ground. Yeah. All these guards are jump. They would run all over you. They're jumping on you. They're running two, 300 cops. Oh. Everybody's on the ground. They're oh. stomping you with these boots <laughs> and you got boxers on like boom, 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 yeah, boom, yeah. boom. They're just running on top of the prisoners. Just so, as for like a sick, just for fun. sick game. Yeah, yeah. Just for fun. And, um, and then they're checking everybody's cells. So first floor cells, they come through with the metal bar and they're starting to bang on the ground because, you know, first floors, yeah. everybody wants to make a tunnel. So yeah. they're checking, they're checking all the floors they, they never check the wall. They would move the fridge, bang on the two squares that I had uh-huh. there, you know, and they'd bang it out and they just put the fridge back Yeah, and the hole was right there on the wall. 
Wow. Yeah. And how far were you from the the escape? We were probably, I would say we were past the, the last wall, the main wall. Yeah. I calculated that the next time we go, we would probably need two to three hours more work and we're popping up right where the dirt is straight, you know, free. And you're outside we're of the walls. outside of the walls. Holy yeah. And did you have a car prepared or? Yeah. The, someone that was going to go with us would have had that car. Okay. Yeah. And you're still financing this by how? I mean, there's really no financing there. I mean, it's just. But I mean, how are you go. putting your money in your pocket at this point? Is it still your liquor business? Or? Oh yeah. My mother, my father, yeah. you know, people would send, send you money or. You okay. Know, but you weren't whatever. selling drugs or anything like that. At no, that point. at this point I wasn't selling drugs. Okay. No. How far into your stretch is this? This is. April 2005, I get caught with the tunnel. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you got, you're in about four or five. Yeah. I'm How about, do they eventually no. catch the tunnel? So a big guy starts pressing me because one of the guys that lives with me tells someone about the tunnel. And uh, one of the mafiosos starts pressing me. He wants, he wants my cell. He wants out. He wants to come. Yeah. I'm like, listen, man, you can come, right? We'll set it up for a day where you can come with us. All right. Yeah. Maybe we'll go, we'll, we'll set something. Mm -hmm. He's like, no, nah, man, I want the sell, you know? And <laughs> this guy had, you know, a bunch of little hitters with him. Yeah. And, uh, eventually it just gets ugly, right? We have a big discussion, you know, he threatens my life. Um, and I tell him basically, you know, it is what it is, bro. If we're going to die, we're going to die here. That's it. Wow. And, um, so pretty, you're ready to kill him over the cell. Like you're, you're I mean, prepared I'm, to I'm kill him. I'm not ready to kill him, but I'm ready to defend myself. Yeah. You know, this is my cell. I'm doing my thing. You know, I, I already told him I could help you out if you want. Maybe we could set something up differently, mm -hmm. but you know, I'm not budging. You know, and, and plus I already got years in and I know a lot of people there. Yeah. You know, I'm not no regular American that just got locked up mm -hmm. there, but I run with the big guys. Mm -hmm. So I tell him, you know, it's not happening. He didn't like it. He lived in a different block and pretty much he put a hit on me. So... A visit day comes. I'm in the cell with my girl. I go to go use a different bathroom because I had to take a shit. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to shit in my own cell. So I'm like, I'll be right back. I put the lock on and I go to a different cell where there's nobody there. I go in. Boom. Before I walk in, I see one of these guys hitters in my block. But it's visit day. And normally nothing happens on visit day, mm -hmm. right? Visit day is really respected. There's yeah. a bunch of kids and women, yeah. you know, it's really respected. Mm -hmm. You got to be careful. But this guy, I saw him, he saw me and I just went about my business, right? Cause I'm like, it's visit day. I go into the cell on visit day. There's so much noise and people there that I close the door and I'm, I'm in the back of the cell doing what I got to do. And when the door opens, I can hear all that. The music, the women, you know, the shouting, the just the noise. Why didn't you lock the door? It didn't have a lock because oh. this is a, a a cell where everybody goes to smoke basuko. Right. They sold the lock on the door. There's no lock. So yeah. I can't lock from the inside. Right. So pants down, doing my business, and I hear the door open. And I get up to look because there's like a wall like to here. Mm -hmm. So I stretch out to look, and he's coming in already with the knife. Dude, I get up, I just pull up my pants immediately, and I just jump at him. Jump at him, I grab him, you know, he stabs me once over here, we're tussling, you know, I'm trying to get him out the door, he's trying to get me back, because I know, if I get back into the bathroom, I'm dead. Once I get into this in the little area that's the bathroom, mm -hmm. I would have died. Why? Um, because it's just, it's slippery there. Yeah. Uh, it's, um, how can I tell you, you know, like, a, uh, the bathroom has like, um, how do you call it? Baldosa. I don't even know how to say it. Bro. I don't know. You've been locked up in so, Latin America so long, you forgot your English. Yeah, I forgot my English. The tiles. Yeah. The tiles were wet. Okay. Right? So I know if I get back into the bathroom, I'm going to slip and I'm dead. Yeah, he's going to get on top he's of you. He's going to get on me yeah. and forget it. So I keep pushing. We're tussling. He stabs me three times. Where? Right in the stomach. And we tussle and I break him through the door. Bloom. We go out and then everybody's just there. And, and this guy runs with the knife. I got a white t-shirt on and it's all bloody. Leaking. Now. Leaking. Okay. So how big was the knife? Um, I would say it was like this big. Ooh, that's a yeah. big blade. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's, so, that's like this people. Uh, that's yeah. a big blade. I'm stabbed up. I'm on the ground. There's people screaming. 
you know, I'm good. I think I'm good. So I go to like get up and walk away, but I look down and then, you know, I've always had a stomach mm. and thank God I had it Yeah. because the doctor told me if you didn't have that, that gut you got, you would have been dead. Oh, so I'm dying. So I look down <laughs> and you know how grease, I don't know if you've ever been stabbed or if you've seen it. I got stabbed. The grease in my belly was coming out in little balls. Yeah. It was coming out of my stomach and I was like, and I like dropped. <laughs> I dropped in, one of my boys came, another one of my boys came, they picked me up, they rushed me out to the main door. Okay. Now the guards pick me up and they're rushing me out to the front and the whole time they're like, who did this, who did this? Tell me before you die. And I was like, I'm, I'm, I didn't say anything. I was just looking at my hand and I was like, damn, this is all gonna end here. Cause you know, I thought I was gonna die. And then I'm thinking about the girl that's still locked in the cell, yeah. right? I'm thinking about my mom, my dad, you know, my sister. And you just die with a, a butthole exactly <laughs> so the guards are like listen you still just didn't tell snitch, me bro. just tell me i didn't snitch just tell me who did it and um i never said anything i passed out when i wake up i'm in the ambulance so i wake up the ambulance is going crazy like 100 miles an hour and then i look and the girl i left in the cell is right next to me and i'm like what are you doing here and she's like oh my god we make it to the hospital. I pass out again. When I wake up during the middle of surgery, I see they have one of my intestines in their hands. So there's a doctor with the intestine. Oh. And I look up like this and the guys, and they're like, oh, medicate him, medicate him. Because I guess they didn't give me enough medication to go to sleep. And they knock me out again. And then I wake up and I'm all sewed up and that's it. You know. <laughs> now, why did, because the guards don't care when another inmate gets killed. Why why did they help you? Why were they in a rush to help I would, you? I would think it's because I'm American. Mm -hmm. And they didn't want to have that on their shift. Right. An American getting murdered right. in the prison on their shift. And maybe it was visiting day. So this is and really- it was visit day, you know, so- It's it was, really disrespectful to it do It was that. a big thing, yeah. Wow. It was a big thing. Wow. And so what happened to- So I go out, hitter? you know, I get sewed up. They bring me back to the jail. They put me in the clinic for recuperation. Mm-hmm. Do yeah. they, when somebody gets stabbed, it, it, like in that prison, are there any on site medical teams or surgeons, or do they always have to send you out to, to get help like that? Well, I mean, they have a doctor and a nurse upstairs, but they I ain't mean, doing shit. They ain't doing shit. They're like yeah. a veterinarian. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they're not doing nothing. Take, t are you stabbed? Take this uh, yeah, time no, off. Yeah. I mean, there were stabbings there. I mean, there was a lot of stabbings mm. there. A lot, you know. But um, so I come back to the jail, they put me in the clinic. It's like on the outside part of the general population, mm -hmm. like by the offices upstairs, one of the floors. And I'm there just recuperating. You know, there's a bunch of other people that have been stabbed there. You know, people have been shot. They're all there with me, everybody. So like, oh, what happened? This and that. So just tell them what happened. They're like, oh, all right. About 15 days go by. I have to go back down the general pop. Get down the general population. You know, everybody sees when I come in. Mm -hmm. You know, people from B Block. I'm sure they've ran and told, you know, he's back. So I, you know, I go in, go to my cell, you know, immediately arm myself. Mm -hmm. I'm just in the cell, you know, got my phone, started making phone calls. That night, I hear the keys, like 10, 30, 11. Stick the mirror out and they're coming to do a search. So I'm like, geez, I hope they don't come here. First cell they go to is my cell. Open the door, everybody out. I'm still, I still got bandages and everything. Mm -hmm. And they call me and they're like, you, come here. Stand right here, right in the doorway. So I stand in the doorway. The first thing he does is grab the fridge and he throws it. Mm -hmm. All my stuff fell out mm -hmm. and he just kicks the wall. Yeah. And he's like, oh, gringo, you thought you were going to leave, huh? Uh, they were like, take him upstairs and fuck. just started beating me. I'm bandaged up and they're beating me. Yeah. So up to the hole, I was in the hole for uh, 45 days. Yeah. What is the hole like in Ecuador, Ecuadorian prison? So in Ecuadorian prison, the hole, you're not by yourself, which I think, I mean, it's a good thing and a bad thing. Yeah, yeah. You're not by yourself, so you're not going to go crazy, but mm -hmm. then you could have an enemy from another block that does something, and you're up there, and they're putting them in with you. They don't care. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> good luck, kid. You know? So- I get up to uh to the hole. Luckily, there was people I knew there. Mm -hmm. Everything was all right. I'm still bandaged up. I'm hurt. 
You know, I haven't even recuperated 100%. But um, my parents actually fly down while I'm in the, in the hole for mm -hmm. 45 days. And they tell them, you know, your son's going to get transferred to Guayaquil. And um, they were like, what could we do for him not to get transferred to Guayaquil? Why was that an issue? Because Guayaquil was, number one, far away from any visit I had. Mm -hmm. Number two, the prison was a lot worse over there. Wow. Um, what, I, is, what is the worst? Is that where the worst prison in Ecuador is? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Tell us about that really quick. Uh, this, this prison is called La Peni, and this is where La Roca exists uh -huh. now, which is the supermax yeah. for the biggest dealers and yeah. killers in Ecuador. Um, that jail is the one that's been going crazy with the riots, you know, yeah. 120 murdered over the weekend. Yeah. You know, they're sending off, you know, dynamite sticks. They're yeah. throwing grenades. They're chopping people up. They're throwing them on the ground. They're lighting them on fire. It's insane. It's like something you've never seen. And if you don't live it or, you know, know somebody that lived through it, I mean, you're not going to believe it. Yeah. Nowadays, luckily, we have, you know, the internet. Yeah. And you can see everything. Yeah. It's like r the Rwanda genocide. I mean, that those levels of brutality. Yeah. It was bad. Okay. So even back then it was bad. Even back then, the stories that people from that come from Guayaquil, La Peni, crazy. You know, shootings every day, eight, 10 hour shootouts between this block to that block. We got AK 47s, <sighs> we got mini Uzis, you know, tech nines, nine millimeters. Yeah. It's insane. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, yeah. And if you try to escape, as you were doing, <clears throat> kept trying to escape, that's where they, they would send you. Yeah, that's where they were going to send me because the two other people that were with me in my cell got sent there. Holy. Luckily, my parents, when they came, they were able to negotiate with the director of the jail. Right. And they sent me to the Max Block F. At the same. Where I meet Colón Pico for the first time. Okay. So they, they kept you at the same prison. They prison. The same prison. They just sent you to F, F yeah. Block. Okay. F Block, yeah. Um, did they have to pay the director at all? Of course. Yeah. Wow. That was paid for. So I, don't, I don't know how much they paid, but it was paid for. You thank God for your parents, dude. Yeah. Do, you, do you, I mean, are you still apologizing? Oh, of course. And, yeah. <laughs> to this Mom, day. Mom, I love you. Don't forget. Yeah. You know, um, she's the best thing that ever happened to me. My father was, you know, awesome. Oh, God, they, I'm going to cry. They went down there with me and, you know, helped me with everything and never abandoned me. Yeah. You know, which is number one. Yeah. But, and they, they're Spanish speakers and they understand, you know, even f being from the third world, yes. like money, cash moves, everything. Everything moves. Yeah. But I'll tell you, they all thought we were millionaires. Yeah. Anybody in the office, any lawyer, yeah. anything that we needed, I need to do with legal fees or paperwork. Or, right. And, you know, he was even trying to get me out with um, pre libertad, which is like parole. Yeah. So they were trying to get me out, even though I had, you know, a couple of uh -huh. escape attempts. Yeah. Paying money, you know, right? He was, he was paying. He was giving the right people money, but right? It just didn't work out. I had so you did have some special status, though. They knew that you were from, you know, a relatively affluent family. Yes. Okay. So you get sent to F Block. Who is this gentleman that you? So meet? this guy Colón Pico is one of the head mobsters of Ecuador. He recently escaped from the jail in Rio Bamba. Um, he runs. Los Lobos and Los Tigorones. So these are big gangs down yeah. in Ecuador. So he's basically like allied with Fito. Mm -hmm. These are all big mobsters. When I was there, they were big people. They were known. Yeah. They trafficked in jail. He was selling weed. He would get pounds of weed thrown from the mountain up top into F block. And <laughs> they he, could do that? Yeah, he was the man. Um, what, was he, what was his original charge? Like these guys basically spend decades if not their, their whole lives in prison yeah. as rich mobsters what did he originally go in for i believe his charge was drug trafficking because okay. he always sold drugs in quito right and he was known for that he used to be part of a gang of this famous lady called mama lucha mm -hmm. and she run she ran the drug business in quito okay. and he was one of her like enforcers and drug dealers so he was in there for Either a drug Big charge. Drugs. Yeah. Okay. And then did he catch another charge? How much time did he have when you met him? Uh, I believe he had a uh, eight year sentence when I met him. Okay. So he had just gotten locked up and they sent him to that okay. maximum security because he's a big name right. at the time. Okay. So, and where is he now? Now he escaped. Nobody knows where he is. Wow. Yeah. 
Wow. He escaped. He tried to negotiate with the president mm -hmm. of, the, of Ecuador, you know, telling him, you know, I'll... I'll turn myself in. Just make sure I'm going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Don't send me somewhere where they're going to murder me and yeah. this and that. And the president was like, no, turn yourself in and that's that. If not, we're going to find you. And um, he's not turned himself in. How long has he been on, been on the run for? I believe it's about two months now. Oh, so he escaped like with Fito. With Fito. Yeah. Oh, days after Fito. Wow. And they and both escaped because this guy's coming in, the new president in Oahu, and he's changing the prisons. Because before, you know, the police are taking care of the prison from outside the walls. Mm -hmm. The guards run the prison inside the yeah. walls. Now, the guards are the ones that bring everything in. Guns, drugs, mm -hmm. grenades, liquor, whatever you want. Mm -hmm. Right? Now, they might have to pay off a cop or two on the way in, especially if we're dealing with keys. Right? But the cops never come inside the jail yeah. over there. Never. They would just stay outside. So when all this killing and all this mayhem is going on inside this small city that's yeah. a jail... The cops were outside like playing volleyball. Yeah. You know, meanwhile, inside there's like AK 47s going right. off, grenades getting thrown. It's, yeah. it's chaos. So now the new president wants to send the cops. Now the president brought in the military mm -hmm. and he's taking over the jails. Right. You know, we want the guards out. We want the cops out. You guys are not doing your job. Right. That's why there's all these, all these things inside mm -hmm. the jail. You guys are bringing everything. He brought in the military. And that's why the gang leaders want to get out. Cause now they can't do whatever they now want. Now they can't do what they were doing before. Mm -hmm. You know, they're before they were running the blocks. Yeah. You know, you have to buy everything from my store yeah. drugs. You have to buy from me. You know, you can't move a pin without right. asking them or saying anything. And you know who they're taking an example from El Salvador. There, I guarantee yes. you, they're taking a, a page out of their playbook. Like, no, no mercy. Yep, that's what they're doing. Yeah, yeah, that's what they're doing. Okay, now so everybody's in uniform, and I mean, their uniform now is everybody's in boxers. They don't want to see anybody with any clothes on. Oh, it's insane. Literally, it's yeah. it's it's brutal. It's just like El Salvador. So that's and they knew that was coming. Yeah, so they were so like, that's why he we're was getting like, out. I'm gone. Okay, not going to live through this. So him and Fito are on the run. They're on the run. Yeah, yeah, and they're not going to be taken alive. I doubt to it. live like no that. way. No, no, they're not going to be taken alive. Um. Okay, so you knew this cat back in 2008, 2006, 2006 in this in in F, in block. F block. Okay, so I get there. He's running the show. Based basically, um. You know, he's the top dog there. He's getting, you know, weed thrown from the mountain inside the jail. You know, he's paying off guards, mm -hmm. he's selling coke. He's doing everything. Now, um, he was a big guy back then. Just when the cartels came into play, they look for the top dogs. Right. So he was one of the top dogs. Right. They go to him. They're like, listen, you know, we got all this stuff. Help us out. You're running the jails. Because mm -hmm. he could be in one jail, but he could be running two or three other jails. Because his gangs are everywhere. How many guys did he have working for him? Oof, I don't know. I mean, that I, I, I couldn't even say. Who knows? It's got to be thousands. Because in the streets, wow. in the jail, you know, these people do whatever this guy wants. How does this guy wield so much power? And another thing is they were, you know, there's a lot of gold mining in Ecuador, right? Right. So his gang was specializing in going in and robbing these gold mines. Holy so They would go in and they would, you know, maybe kidnap everyone in the gold mine. They'd mm -hmm. kidnap their entire family, Right. And then they'd go to the gold mine and be like, listen, every, wow. all the gold's for us. Yeah. Start taking all this stuff out. Wow. You know, and they take all the gold. Yeah. And they've hit multiple gold mines yeah. in Ecuador. Yeah. So think about it. Every hit, what are you getting? 1,000 pounds, yeah. 800 pounds. Who knows? And gold's going up. Gold so just keeps going up. Keeps going up. Who knows? So, and, and how 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 does one individual wield this kind of power? It must be because he's a killer. He's, he's willing he's to just- He's a killer and the fame and, mm -hmm. you know- just his history. Yeah. Right. You it's know? Pablo Escobar stuff. It's, yes. it's that's, all of that. That's the way it's it clout. Is. Yeah. Okay. That's the so way Ecuador is. has really become of some kind of a version of Colombia in the eighties. Yeah. Like Colombia in the eighties, mm -hmm. pretty much. Okay. So, and, and what did he like you? Did what, were you working with him? Were you, I wasn't working with him. Uh, F block only the, you know, top dogs can move something. Yeah. You know, you can't just say nobody could just sell anything. Yeah. Yeah. So he was the only one selling. He was the only one controlling anything. You wanted to do anything in that block. You had to talk to him. Now we were good. Yeah. I mean, we were good like war wise. There was no war going yeah. on. There was no enemies yeah. in that block at the time. Yeah. Everybody that was there was cool with each other. So, yeah. you know, there was no problems. Yeah. Now the day comes where there's a shootout in Guayaquil and here comes trouble. So one day we're all there and, um, the guards start uh, police, like a police custodial, start bringing in people. 
you know, bunch of cops bringing in people with, they all had black hoodies on their head. And we're just watching from the cell. We're like, what is this? Just bringing in people, bringing in people. They brought in like 40 people. So here comes the gangs from Guayaquil. And now these guys want to take over. Yeah, oh. You know, and Colón Pico's over here. He's like, this is my spot. What are you doing? Mm. You know, they almost killed him. You know, he had to run out of uh, Max. You know, he was banging on the, the guards' doors from the take him out because they were going to slice him up. Yeah. How did they take him over? They were just stronger? Oh, they put a, a gun to your face, you know? <laughs> no, but I'm saying, like, how did he, how did this Colón Pico allow a new gang to just run him out like that? Because it was just, like, it's just more and more people. They had you numbers. Know, more people, more numbers, and yeah. more killers. Right. You know, when you have, you know, 20 people on your team that are not afraid to kill somebody, yeah. and they have a history of this, mm. then, you know, it's, you're going to win. Were there some bodies that got dropped in that process? No, no bodies got dropped. So they just yeah. basically They ran just came and take over, ran them out. They said, listen, get, get out of here. You're going. And all you guys work for us now. Yeah, now all <sighs> you guys are screwed. So, yeah, it was pretty bad. Um they tried to, uh, since they knew I was friends with him, you know, they tried to start extorting me, mm -hmm. right? Um, I locked up. I what got, does that mean? I locked myself in my cell. Okay. So um, I was like, I'm not doing it. They were coming to my window. Like, white boy, you're not going to pay up, white boy? No, I'm not paying. They would uh, throw piss inside through the window. You know, they put a mattress up against my door. And they lit it on fire. Yeah. All the smoke was coming in. You know, I'm banging on the door. I'm screaming out the window. And I thought I was going to die because of all the smoke. Uh, just crazy things, man. How long did that go on for? Uh, I would say like three weeks until my parents were able to get me out of there. Paying money again. How, how did, and then where did you go? They put me in uh, this place that's recuperation for drug addicts. It's okay. like the clinic. So they eventually, with enough visits and enough money to the director of that prison yeah. and whoever else, yeah. right? Maybe couple a couple people. other guys yeah. they, they share it with. Yeah. They were able to get you to basically what's like a halfway house. Something like that. Yeah. Okay. And how long did you have to stay there for? I was there for about six months. Yeah. I was there for about six months. Um, it was pretty good. There's no problems. Yeah. You know, everybody's just um, in, in rehab. Yeah. And um, gain some weight, doing, uh, you know, exercise, playing mm -hmm. soccer, volley, yeah. you know, eating good. And after six months, they were like, all right, you got to go. Boom. They kicked me out back to general pop. So I got there and I got Wait, back. back to the same prison you were just at. Yeah. Okay. Back to the general pop. But you're not on F block anymore. No, not on F block. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's in the same prison, but a different right. part. So it's the maximum security is A. Then we have B, C, and D, which mm -hmm. is general population. Mm -hmm. Then we have E. And then we have F block, which is the maximum right. security for, you know, the killers. Right. And that's where all that Colon Pico. And yeah, that's where. They so all that. after the riots, when they, they, you know, chisel the holes in the wall, yeah. they come, do they make them stronger? Like, do they reinforce the walls better? Not at all. Okay. They just come back and cover up those holes and keep it going. Great. Yeah. Yeah. What a that country right. is. Yeah. Um, okay. So, and then how much time do you have left on your stretch? Uh, God, I feel like this is never ending, dude. Yeah, the stretch, I was probably in like five and a half at that time. Mm -hmm. So I get to E Block. I meet up with an old friend. Uh, his name was Vinuesa. He was uh, very known in the jail system. He tried to escape a couple times. He sold drugs and we were boys. So I hooked up with him. We were like the dynamic duo on our, on our block. Um, started, you know, selling basuco. You know, I started consuming a little bit. Again, as well, at nighttime, when, you know, day's over, I locked in my cell, smoke a little bit. A base? Yeah, a base. With the weed. Uh-huh. Um, and then just started, you know, selling, extortioning, you know, getting into the game. And after a couple complaints, bam, again to F block. Yeah. When are you going to learn? Now, were you giving up at this point? Did you feel like you were... Just say, I'm going to go bad. Like, I mean, the thing is that when you're in a jungle, you have to turn into an animal mm -hmm. because if not, you're screwed. Mm -hmm. So, and on top of that, you got so many years in mm -hmm. and then, you know, all the people that you're with are doing the same thing. You, you're going to adapt. I mean, it's all a part of it. You know, I adapted to my situation and tried to mm -hmm. make the best out of it. How, uh, okay. So you're on, you're on F block. So back yeah. with these goons. Get back to F block with the goons. And um, 
I did my last nine months there. Mm. So while I'm on F Block, this new president, Rafael Correa, signs the treaty. Right. And then all the foreigners could go. Right. One day out of the blue, they come to F Wing and they're like, we need you to come out. They handcuff me, boom, boom. They take me to the office and I sign the paper. I'm like, what am I signing? They're like, this is your, your paperwork. You're going free. Right. I was ecstatic. I was wow. like, what? They were like, yeah, you're going free. But the bad news is we can't let you go yet. I was like, what do you mean? They're like, yeah, immigration's backed up. So you're going to have to, I'm like, I have to go back to F wing. They're like, yeah, you're going back to F block. F block, 22 hours a day locked in your cell, two hours a day in the patio. You got no food from the outside. Mm. You can only eat the food from the jail, which is the worst. And um, 90% of the people in there are all big time drug addicts. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about they're smoking heroin, they're smoking pata base. And when these people don't have drugs, they're going crazy. Mm. It's like a nut house in there. Right. You know, at night when you're locked in your cell, everybody's screaming. Holy you know, shit. it's just insane, man. Oh my God. Yeah. And what do you do? What do you do? Like, are there books? Are there? There's nothing. I luckily was able to pay a guard 40 bucks to um, smuggle me in a small black and white TV radio thing. Mm -hmm. So I would, you know, everybody on my side of the floor, because we were separated even though I'm on the first floor, the left side is separated from the right side with huge um, bars. So yeah. you can't get past. But on my side, there were six of us, and we would all go to my cell and watch TV. My stove was a brick, a large brick <laughs> with um, a metal, um, what do we call these things? Nicolina, we call it in Spanish. Mm, a burner? So it's it's something like a burner. I would have to plug in these cables into yeah. the socket yeah. and it would light it's like up. Like a hot plate. Like a hot plate mm -hmm. and it would heat up the brick mm -hmm. and then we could, you know, yeah. maybe fry an egg or some fried plantain, wow. some French fries, yeah. whatever. And I would keep it on 24 seven because it was so cold. Wow. We could use it as a heater. Yeah. You know, so yeah. we would sit around, you know, watch that TV, but- mm. I mean, it was the worst. Yeah, it's miserable. The worst. It's hell on earth. Yes. Wow. Um, but at least you're locked down, so there's not a lot of like violence. Yeah, there's not a lot of violence. I mean, w once you go outside, the violence occurs in the patio. Yeah. But like I said, this time we were good. There wasn't too many enemies. So yeah, yeah. And then uh, okay, and then immigration opens up. Immigration opens up. They come and uh, they're like, "All right, Mr. Castro, let's go," and they walk me out, which was probably the one of the best days of my life, you know, walking out of this supermax, with all these killers, you know, everybody staying behind. I'm giving away, you know, a little TV, my clothes, my hat, my sneakers, <sighs> anything I had, I left everything. All I brought was, you know, those pictures you see there, yeah. you know, and um, the clothes I had on my back. That's people it. yelling. People are like, white boy, bro, yeah. don't ever come back here, bro. Yeah. You know, yeah. stay free. And yeah. Like, all right, man. Wow. Yeah. Wow. It's crazy. But, yeah. you know, also- you feel this, like I feel it to this day. Like I tell you, my friend, he's been there for like 19 years, mm -hmm. right? The moment I walked out, you know, before I walked out, I had an issue with another prisoner there. And there was an issue over drugs. And I'll tell you, at the moment I was, I made the decision, I'm going to stab the shit out of this guy. And I walked into my friend's cell and I was like, listen, man, I need a knife. You know, I want to, I want to go stab this kid right now. Cause you know, he's, he's disrespecting me and I'm already free. Right. I already signed my paperwork, yeah. but they're not letting me go anywhere. And I'm here. So in my head, you know, the drugs, the psychosis, you know, all these thoughts mm -hmm. are going through your head. Like, do they want me to kill somebody because they want to see me here every day? Yeah. Do I have to do this? And then this other kid, you know, he had a 20 year sentence. You know, I'm waiting for drugs to get thrown from the other side and they throw it. And this kid grabs my drugs and runs with it. And he's got a 20 year sentence. So what am I going to do? Go ask for my drugs? No, you got to go fight this kid with a knife now. Mm -hmm. So I walk in my friend's cell. I'm like, listen, I was like, I, I've decided I want to do this. And he's like, bro, what are you nuts? You want to stay here with me? Mm. He's like, you see my life? You see what we do here? He's like, you don't want to be here. Yeah. He's like, bro, you're already free. He's like, I'm going to leave. And I'm going to leave you in here for a couple minutes. And I need you to think about what you just told me. All right. And when I come back, you let me know if you want to do it or not. If you do, I'll give you the knife. And I'll go out there and make sure nobody gets in your way. But remember, you're going to die in here just like me. So he left and he locked me in a cell. And with the emotions I had that day, you know, like I was crying. I was so angry. Mm. And I was like, God, you know, do you want me to go free or do I have to stay here? Do I have to go and kill this sucker right now? You know, like mm. I feel it right now. Like my, yeah. you know, I get like the chills, man. So... 
after contemplating what I was going to do mm-hmm. at the moment, you know, my friend comes back in. He's like, so you ready? And I was like, you know what, man? You're right. You know, thank you. You know, thank you for being a friend. Mm-hmm. He's like, bro, the kid's garbage. Are you going to go stab him for what? For drugs? He's like, bro, you're going to go home. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Don't worry about this. Bullshit. Yeah. All right? He's like, just relax. He's like, whatever you got time left. He's like, we're, you know, we, we're going to do it together. Mm-hmm. You know, he's like, but you're going to go home. And I was like, bro, but they don't take me out of here. I want to leave. He's like, all right, tomorrow morning, we'll take over a guard. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so the guard comes in in the morning to open up the doors and bam, we grab him. Call over the radio. We want the director in here. <sighs> yeah. Director comes in, you know, we got the guard in the cell. You know, what's the deal with white boy? Why isn't he going free? He signed the paperwork three, three months ago. You know, and I start going crazy. I'm like, you guys want to see me here every day? You want me to kill a guard? You want me to not leave here? Because that's what's going to happen. I'm going to stay here forever. And they were like, no, don't worry. We're going to talk. We're going to get you out of here. And the next day they got me out. <gasps> next day they came from immigration wow. and took me. Holy. Like they can make it happen if they want to. So that's, you know, I go back to when I left, you know, I'm just, I looked at my boy. I'm like, bro, thank you. Wow. You know, because he stayed and I get to leave. Yeah. You know, he's there till this day. Do you talk to him still? Of course. Oh, man. It's he's insane. doing a life sentence? I mean, he doesn't have life, but, you know, he's killed Basically. a couple of people inside, so he's not leaving. Yeah. Wow. Have you been, and you haven't been back to Ecuador? No. <laughs> never. Yeah. yeah. Crazy, man. All right, man. Well, hey, we're going to switch over to the Patreon now, but uh, thank you for giving us a movie, because that's what that was. That was a movie. And, uh, you know, perhaps we'll talk about writing a screenplay about it. That's my life, man. I just yeah. want to get it out there. And not so much for the stories, but, you know, for the young people out there that think about drug trafficking, going to foreign countries, don't do it. The young you know? people? I- I've been thinking about it this whole time. Don't do it. <laughs> it's not worth it. You're going to end up in a lot of trouble. You might not make it back. You know, I had tons of friends I had when I went into jail. They're not around anymore. Mm-hmm. I'm one of the lucky ones. You know, I thank God every day I was able to come out. I'm still alive. I'm healthy. You know, I'm pushing forward. You know, I got a business, my wife, you know, and I'm, I'm just happy. I'm happy to see you. Thank you for the opportunity that you gave me today. You know, I appreciate it. And hopefully we could work in the future. Oh man, no, it was beautiful. Thank you for coming. Uh, we, we owe you one. So, uh, and you, we may see a podcast from you. Yes, coming sir. Coming out. So. Hopefully, yes. With the help of uh, maybe you or Ian. Yeah. You know, we're going to get things out there and maybe work in the future together. We'll yeah. see how it goes. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Oscar. Appreciate it, buddy. Thank you, sir. All right, guys. Patreon.com slash The Connect Show for more Oscar Castro. Peace. Peace.